tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. You think good and evil don't exist? That ain't true. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I've even seen the devil. Our family was small, just my parents, my older brother Jacob and me. Ma always doted on me. Being the baby and all, much to Pa's annoyance, he'd tell her at the dinner table, Stop babying him, gal. And she'd coo at him and say, Don't worry. He'll grow up big and strong just like your other son. I hope so. I always admired my brother Jacob. He was tall like Pa and almost as strong, too. Ma always liked to tell the story about when Jacob was six and he tried to help Pa work the plow. And how the horses dragged him through the dirt and broke his arm, but he didn't even cry. He never cried. Maybe Jacob wanted to be like Pa, just like I wanted to be like Jacob. He even looks just like Pa when he was at that age, Ma would say. I'll never forget the night Satan destroyed our family. But I can't jump right to that. We were good Christian people. I'd say grace at every meal. A prayer at bedtime even combed the nits out of my hair to look nice for church on Sunday. If there was one person in town more devoted to the Lord than me, it was Pa. It was him that made sure me and Jacob grew up right, showed proper respect to him and Ma, and followed the teachings of the Bible. Not many other people from town would stop and talk to us after church. I thought most looked at our family with a jealous eye because of what we had. I even saw old Lady Milton giving Ma the stink eye once as we were heading to our car after a service. But I didn't say nothing because it wouldn't be right to speak ill of someone, even when they were thinking bad thoughts of you. That's not to say I never got in trouble. I wasn't no saint by any means. And sometimes Jacob would talk me into playing hooky with him to go fishing down some river or shirk a chore he thought Pa wouldn't notice hadn't got done while he was away in town. Sometimes even Ma would be in on it and she'd encourage me to go play, knowing I still had to milk the cows or feed the pigs. I knew I'd get in trouble if Pa found out but Ma would stroke my head and whisper that she wouldn't tell. She was so good at convincing me to do what I knew was wrong, and she didn't have to tell Pa. Most of the time, I'd feel guilty after and try to make up the work, and if I couldn't, I'd just confess to Pa myself, though I tried to keep Jacob or Ma out of it. That didn't rarely work, of course. Pa had a way of sniffing the guilt out of us. Whenever it came down to punishment, though, I got off easy. Maybe it was because of my age, because uh, well, whenever I got into trouble, I'd get sent to a corner to read the good book. Jacob's punishment was always being put out in the fields to work, sometimes long into the night. I felt bad that Jacob's punishment was always more severe than mine. Pa would go get him hours later, and he'd clearly be exhausted. But he always had a determined look on his face, too, like he would have worked until the next day if he had to. Ma would bring him a glass of water and pet his hair and tell him how good he was. Of course, then I'd be caught watching from the corner, and they'd shoo me back to reading and staring at the wall. It was one of those nights of punishment when I first saw it. Pa had gone into town after lunch. Jacob was out by the road fixing some fencing, and I was cleaning out the hayloft. Ma came into the barn, looking pretty as ever, with a glowing smile, and called down to me where she handed me a glass of lemonade. She said it was such a fine day, as she patted my cheek, and such a lovely day, it was a shame to waste all of it cooped up 
and that I should go down to the river and play for a bit. Not too long, though, she laughed, and gave me a pinch. The father will be back before dinner. So I ran down to the river thinking about skipping stones and listening to the wind rustle through the trees. Of course, when you're little, you don't have a good sense of time, and it turned out a season of frog eggs had hatched, which distracted me for hours. When Ma sent Jacob to look for me, I was soaked to the core from falling over trying to catch tadpoles. You twit. He smirked at me. Is this what you've been up to? We gotta get home. Dad'll be there any minute, and you need to change into something dry. I realized Jacob was yeah, right. The shadows had gotten long while I wasn't paying attention. Oh, nuts. We sprinted back like a tornado was on our heels, but when we got there, Pa's truck was already parked out front, and there he was on the porch waiting for us. He looked more disappointed than angry, which was a relief, because it meant things wouldn't be too bad that time. Pa, I, I stammered. Go inside now, he said with a nod. He was looking at Jacob. I glanced at Jacob and realized Pa misunderstood the situation. I had to make things right. Sir, I said, this was my fault. Jacob had nothing to do with it. He just went and got me when he realized I was gone. That right, Jacob. Pa cocked his head at Jacob. No, sir, Jacob said to my astonishment. I won't let him lie for me. We're both guilty here. I don't know what to say. I couldn't understand why Jacob was lying and allowing himself to get in trouble. It wasn't going to lessen my punishment. If anything, it was going to make things worse. Pa sat there for a while, staring at both of us, and I could see the heat rising in his face. Finally, he pointed at me. You, get inside and get up to your room. My room? I didn't normally go to my room as punishment. You're done for the day. Get ready for bed. My common sense was screaming for me to shut up and do as he said, but my mouth kept going. Why? There it was, the glint of anger in his eyes. We could see him clenching and releasing his fists to try to contain his rage at my defiance for lying to me on top of everything. Now get! It'll be all right, Jacob whispered, nudging me forward. But all I could think of was how it would have been if he hadn't lied. Inside, Ma was watching from the oven while she stirred a pot of soup. She gave me a sad, guilty-looking smile then ushered me over to her. Leaning down, she kissed me on the forehead. I'm so sorry, my sweet boy. It'll be all right. I didn't lie, I insisted. She just shook her head. You'll understand someday. I felt tears swelling up in my eyes, and I hurried to my room embarrassed. I didn't dare slam the door, but I really wanted to. Instead, I took my frustration out by opening and shutting my drawers really forcefully until I had calmed down. As I watched out the window, Pa led Jacob into the fields. When they're out of sight, I brushed my teeth, said my prayers, and got into bed. Neither Pa nor Ma came to check on me, so I just lay there with my hands together, asking Jesus to help me understand why Jacob had done what he did. Hours crept by. I remember hearing Pa and Ma down in the kitchen, talking and having dinner. Pa mostly grumbled loudly, stuff I couldn't understand, while Ma said things like, That's okay, and you know they love you. Eventually, I drifted off to sleep. When I woke up, the moon was peeking through my window. I didn't know what time it was, but it felt late enough that everyone else must have been in bed. I could hear crunching coming from outside and I rolled over to look out the window, wondering if one of the cows had gotten loose. The horror I felt when I saw our scarecrow walking by in the moonlight was like my heart was clawing its way up my throat. 
Let me tell you about our scarecrow. It wasn't anything fancy or nothing, but it did the job. Just one of Pa's old checkered shirts and a pair of extra-large overalls. Grandpa Ulysses had gotten from Goodwill. All stitched together like a bag with a pair of shoddy gardening gloves and shit kickers and is stuffed with straw. The head was a burlap sack that someone had sewn and a pair of big black shiny shoe button eyes on. Pa had said it had been part of the family for generations, that they'd had it when he was little and his pa before him. When a piece of the clothes got too ragged or old, they'd get replaced, but it was the same burlap head as he remembered when he was a child. And it was walking through our front yard toward the barn. I was frozen in fear. Normally the scarecrow hangs draped out in the far field like a sack of old potatoes. But that night it had grown. The buttons on its shirt were straining to burst. Straw was spilling out of it, and yet it kept moving. It walked like a robber in a cartoon, picking up the boots with each step as it crept across our yard under the light of the moon. Just as it was about halfway to the barn, the head rotated on its neck, and it looked up directly at my window. I ducked down. Knowing for certain Satan himself had just seen me, I didn't know what to do, because my instinct was to run to Ma and Pa and tell them what I saw. But I was so stunned by the terror of it all that I immediately started questioning whether what I had seen was real or my imagination. And I didn't want to get in bigger trouble for waking Pa up with crazed stories of the devil in our scarecrow. When I peeked back up over the windowsill, the yard was empty. I sighed and relaxed a little, before other thoughts started going through my head. Was it real? What if it saw me looking at it and was coming to get me as I knelt there? I dove back into bed, but I couldn't sleep. I lay there, huddled under my covers, listening for the sound of it breaking a window downstairs, or even just crunching as it walked back across the yard. Neither sound ever came. Morning came, and I jumped out of bed when the rooster crowed, hurrying to get dressed and downstairs. Pa was already up, as usual, making breakfast. He looked at me with a stoic expression and asked if I had something I wanted to tell him. My first thought was to start yammering that I'd seen Satan in our scarecrow last night. Then I realized that wasn't the answer he was looking for. I'm sorry, sir, I said. For what? I sighed. For lying. He nodded and handed me a plate of eggs and toast. After my morning meal, I went and did my chores, but I steered clear of the far field where the scarecrow was. I almost convinced myself that the whole thing had been a dream. But part of me deep inside couldn't get over the notion that it felt too real to have been imagined. Was I crazy? Maybe I had fallen asleep and had one of them real vivid nightmares where you wake up and you think you've been awake to begin with. Jacob came by at one point and tussled my hair. I thought about asking him why he'd lied about everything yesterday. But instead, I decided to ask him something else. Do you believe in the devil? He looked half surprised and half amused by my question. Mm -hmm, sure, why? Do you think he's like a physical person? You mean, can you run into him? Hell, I don't know. He set down the tools he was carrying and squinted at me. Why are you asking? The last thing I wanted was Jacob laughing at me thinking I was a silly little baby. I had a dream about him. Well, yeah, what'd he look like? I saw the scarecrow in my mind. He had black eyes and no mouth. Well, it couldn't have been the devil then. Well, why's that? That's how he gets you, isn't it? He's the great deceiver. If he's got no mouth, what's he going to lie to you with? He winked at me and tapped the side of his nose. And then, grabbing the tools, went back to what he was doing. 
By the end of the day, I was more certain than ever that I had dreamt it all. A product of my guilty mind, I must have felt so ashamed of myself for letting everything go wrongly yesterday that I dreamed the purveyor of eternal punishment had come up from hell to take me back with him. After our most recent shenanigans, Jacob and I were as good as angels, trying to appease Pa. Up at dawn, doing our chores, getting homework done as soon as we got home, properly washing our plates after dinner, reading silently until bedtime, then giving Pa a hug and kissing Ma goodnight before heading off to bed. Ma would smile and pet us gently and tell us what lovely son she had. And no devil came around. I was relieved. Almost a week passed before I saw him again. I hadn't even done anything wrong that day. Maybe I said my prayers a little too fast before climbing into bed. I wasn't sure. All I knew was I woke up to the sound of soft swishing from outside. Rolled over, still half asleep. There was a scarecrow walking out of the field again. It lurched past Pa's truck, swinging its arms like it had trouble steadying itself. Its boots thumped with each step louder than before, not the least bit concerned with being noticed. There was a scream inside of me, but it was trapped down in my gut. I was paralyzed, unable to look away. I don't think I would have been able to hide it if it turned its head to look at me again. Fortunately, it didn't. It just kept walking, right past the house and out toward the barn. As I watched, it stopped at the barn door, pulled open the door, and entered. I could see a faint light coming from inside. Oh, Lady Milton, I whispered. I don't know why that was my first thought, but I felt certain she had cursed us, envious of our love and devout family. Despite my paralyzing fear, I felt an obligation. I had to do the Lord's work and drive the devil out. My hands were shaking as I got out of bed. Grabbing my Bible and my housecoat, I snuck downstairs, not daring to turn on any of the lights as I went. I crept through the dark house to the front door, avoiding all the known squeaky boards and even held a clasp on the screen door so it wouldn't wake Ma Pa when I shut it. Every step I took through the yard sounded like the stomp of a hippopotamus in my ears. My vision was dampened by the cloudy night, but I could still make out a flickering firelight from just beyond the barn door. I pondered what I'd find when I got there. Maybe a portal straight to hell itself. Every nerve was straining my body tense, ready to turn tail and run, if need be, while I whispered to myself the Lord's Prayer, holding the Bible over my heart to protect me. My breathing got so ragged from the tension that I was sure the devil would hear me coming long before I got there. As I got closer, I heard a noise coming from inside the barn. It was faint at first, but the nearer I got, the clearer it became. It was a woman crying. It almost sounded like Ma. The last few feet I crouched down low and scampered to the barn door to peek inside, wondering why Ma would be outside that late at night. The day will never come that I'll forget what I saw. The barn was lit by an old oil lantern hanging from one of the beams. Just underneath it, someone had laid out one of our blue-flowered picnic blankets that we'd sit on as a family to watch the fireworks in town. Ma was lying on the picnic blanket in her robe and nightgown, her knees bent and legs apart, and the scarecrow was on top of her. My first reaction was, Lord, help me. Satan's attacking my mother. I gripped the edge of the door, about to charge forward and leap on his back, tear at him with tooth and nail if need be. Then I heard her cry out again and realized she wasn't in pain. It was sex. The devil was violating her. Or worse, she was giving herself willingly to him. I wanted to yell to make them stop and see me, 
but at the same time, I felt a weird kind of curiosity. Embarrassed to say, I saw Ma's bare leg running up the scarecrow's side and her hands stroking his back as they ground against each other. And quietly, I watched for a while, kneeling there, trembling, feeling scared and ashamed and angry. Eventually, I couldn't take it any more, and I crept back to the house, looking over my shoulder the whole way, as my mother's moans faded into the distance. Every step I was certain, the barn door would swing open, and Satan, in his scarecrow disguise, would come bounding across the yard to snatch me up before I could get to safety. Once I got back to my room, I lay in bed, reliving what I had seen in my head, listening for any sound of movement from outside. When I fell asleep, my dreams were of fire and brimstone, and my ma burning. The following morning, when I got up, Pa was already out in the fields with Jacob. Ma was cleaning the breakfast dishes, and though she smiled at me when I came into the kitchen, something felt off about the expression in her eyes. My Bible was on the breakfast table next to a bowl of oatmeal and a glass of oranges. I picked it up, realizing I'd dropped it by the barn, in my haste to get away last night. Were you outside with your book yesterday? Ma asked as she rinsed off her hands. Of course, the funny look in her eyes was worry. She was trying to hide her concern that I'd seen her with the devil, and I knew it. Thinking quick, I told a shameful lie. Is that where I lost it? I had it in my pocket, but it must have fallen out sometime. Ma closed her eyes and sighed, visibly relieved. I wasn't ready to let her off the hook, though, and I needed to know, anyway, whether her role in what I had witnessed last night was one of a willing partner, or was she being controlled by evil forces? I had a hard time believing she would do what she did of her own free will. No one wants to believe their mother is Satan's whore. Mom, she blinked, unused to me calling her that. Yeah, you believe in hell. The question put her back on guard, and she wrinkled her brow while at the same time trying to fake a laugh. <laughs> what a question. Of course, I believe in hell. Why are you asking such a thing? The tension in the air that had started to dissipate returned, and everything got quiet, like all the background noise just drained from the world. I couldn't hear anything save my own breathing and the tinkling of the ditches as she stacked them in a drying rack. I don't know. I just wonder sometimes why people do things. I paused for a moment, watching her look out the window. Things they know will cause them to suffer later. Well, that's a good question. Ma turned back from the sink leaned against the counter, and forced one of her dazzling smiles. Maybe you should bring that up with your pastor on Sunday. I stared down at my oatmeal. I guess so. I didn't know what to make of it all. There was a smidgen of doubt brewing inside me that was wondering if maybe what I'd seen wasn't real. After all, wasn't it possible that the devil had been tricking me like Jacob said he does, trying to cause me to doubt my own mother. Only one thing in both scenarios was for certain. If what I had seen was real, I needed to destroy the scarecrow. If what I'd seen was a fiction, I needed to destroy the scarecrow. Either way, that scarecrow had to go. It was the vessel Satan was using after all. With it gone... He had no way to get to us, neither my mother nor me. My only fear was facing it alone. Pa would think I was nuts, and I still wasn't sure if I trusted Ma. Somehow I needed to get Jacob to help me. The chance came sooner than I thought it would. That afternoon, when I was in the backyard splitting wood, 
When Pa and Jacob returned from the fields in the middle of a heated argument, their voices raised enough that I heard them coming. Someone slammed the screen door as they went inside, and a moment later Ma crept up with a load of laundry to hang on the line. As she passed, she looked at me and shook her head to indicate that I should stay out. They were still yelling five minutes later when I finished up and went inside to wash my hands. There was a lot of back and forth, but the gist of their disagreement was over something that had been a sour point in the household for years. Namely, Jacob going to college. Jacob was 20 and had been convinced for years that Pa had money stashed away that could be used to at least help him get a GED. But whenever he broached the subject, Pa would insist that there was no money. It was all in the farm, and that he needed both of us here to keep the place from collapsing into disrepair. What's going to happen when you and Mom are gone? Jacob shouted. He gestured at me. You expect us to live like a couple of hermits on this dilapidated old farm? Of course not. Pa was looking at his wit's end, and I wondered how long they'd been yelling at each other out in the field before coming inside, and it's not dilapidated. I need to get out, Dad. Jacob took Pa's hand, trying to get him to look him in the eye, but Pa, he pulled away. I want to build things. Pa glared at him. Like what? Office buildings? Like a family, for one. You got a family right here. Stop being so obtuse. Jacob's face turned red and he threw his arms out as he yelled. His right hand slapped the old Chinese urn off the fireplace mantel, scattering Grandpa Ulysses' ashes across the floor. Everything froze. I was covering my mouth in a gasp. Jacob had his arms out in that angry, flailing gesture, and Pa, Pa just stood there staring as the urn went over, end over end throwing out a spiraling cloud of his father's remains. What have you done? It wasn't a question, just a whisper. Jacob let his arms drop to his side and looked at the mess. I... What have you done? Pa roared. His hand shot out faster than I'd seen in years and struck Jacob so hard across the face a line of spittle flew off his lips. I flinched and grabbed my ears, trying to shrink out of sight. For a moment I thought it was working too, because my father seemed to grow larger, filling the space between him and Jacob. He hadn't, of course. Pa just been so often hunched over from toiling away every day in the fields that we weren't used to seeing him stand up straight. He really was a big man, like Mom always said. And even Jacob, as big and strong as he was, looked small next to him. Dad! Oh, I'm sorry! Jacob cried, holding his burning cheek. He dropped to the floor and tried to sweep up the ashes with his hands. But this only enraged Pa further, who grabbed him by the neck and lifted him off his knees with one hand. You're going out in the field tonight, boy! Pa snarled through clenched teeth. I didn't mean to. I'd never seen Jacob so shaken. At the same time, something in the back of my mind said, This is exactly what I needed. This is providence, God's will. The voice in my head was right. It seemed awful to think it, but the pastor always said, The Lord works in mysterious ways. Ma came running in just as Pa turned Jacob toward the door. What happened? What are you doing to my boy? She looked at the mess on the floor and went quiet. Jacob twisted, visibly in pain, from the hand squeezing his neck. Ma, I'm sorry. He's got to learn his place, Pa said with a frightening calm in his voice. He shoved Jacob out the front door, letting it slam shut behind them. Ma looked over at me. Fetch the room. Be quick about it. In the kitchen, I got the broom and dustpan out of a cabinet. Looking out the window, I watched as Pa and his struggling Jacob cut across the lawn, disappearing among the crops. Thank you, God. 
I whispered. We had dinner in silence that evening. I said grace quietly to myself, and I saw Pa do the same, his large, powerful hands folded in front of him. Ma just looked out the window at the sun on the horizon with an unsettling sadness in her eyes. She didn't finish her meal, either. I cleared the table for both of them when we were finished, taking every careful precaution to stay on Pa's good side. The last thing I needed was my own punishment, preventing me from sneaking off to the field. In fact, I was terrified that, as I stood at the sink picking food off the dishes and plotting each of my next steps, the devil was out there, actively plotting against me. As the night settled, we all sat in the living room and read while the news came over the radio. I wasn't really paying attention to what I was looking at, though. My mind was too preoccupied with visualizing each next move I needed to make. The forecaster on the radio warned of a thunderstorm approaching, and Ma leaned toward Pa, trying to keep her voice to a whisper. Are you going to make him stay out there all night? In the rain? Pa sighed and shut his book. He looked for a long while at the spot on the floor, where his father's ashes had been scattered. When you got his anger up, he'd go off like a tea kettle. But just like a kettle, once the heat was off, it'd simmer and cool. I'll have him come in in an hour, fair? Ma nodded. My mind was thrown into a panic. I had to move up my plans fast, or I'd have no one to help me when I went out to the field to confront the scarecrow. Matches. I needed matches. No, the devil lives in fire, and I risk burning the whole field down. What then? I was on the verge of pulling my hair out, trying to come up with something, when I had a sliver of an idea. Excuse me, I said, sticking my book in my pocket and standing up. Both parents turned to look at me. I needed something that wouldn't draw suspicion, nor get me in trouble, just a little white lie in the name of righteousness. I just realized I forgot to put the mall back in the shed. Pa gestured to the door with one hand, I better go do that. It's supposed to rain tonight. I don't want to find rust on my tools. Fetching a flashlight from the kitchen, I hurried out onto the porch. Even though they knew I was going outside, I still held the door so that it shut softly, like I was afraid to startle them. My first goal was achieved. I was out. Next, I walked around back to where the woodblock was. I hadn't actually forgotten to put them all away. But I wanted them to hear me in the backyard, just to avoid raising their suspicion. After shuffling around the yard for a minute, I walked back around to the shed and stood there looking at the mall in its proper place in the wall. Now, a mall is good for splitting wood, but I wasn't sure if I'd have enough leverage to swing it well at something up high, like the scarecrow on its post. Fortunately, I had my pick of other implements on display on either side of the mall, mostly gardening tools, a trowel, a watering can, old pair of pruning shears, from before Paul pulled up all the bushes around the house to build Ma her garden, a shovel, and a spading fork with four ten-inch steel tines. I grabbed the fork off the wall and felt its weight and balance in my hands. I wasn't strong, but with the fork I didn't need to be. I just needed to put all my weight behind it. Shutting the shed door, I was more determined than ever to go through with my plan. I knew I didn't have much time, either. His pa would no doubt be keeping an eye on the clock, and I could hear the soft rumble of thunder in the distance, hinting at the approaching storm. Ducking low, I dashed past the living room windows, across the driveway and into the field. Immediately, I felt a wave of fear crash over me. Somewhere among the crops, Jacob was working, but somewhere else there was a scarecrow, and it had the devil in it. Not to mention, back at the house, Ma would soon be politely commenting that I was sure taking my time 
and wondering where I'd scampered off to. Time was of the essence, as they say. I needed to find Jacob and then the scarecrow. I could hear my heart thumping in my chest. Somewhere nearby there came a rustling. Or was it the wind? I shivered. Jacob, I whispered. No answer. I hurried down another road trying to use the stars for guidance, but they were quickly concealed behind heavy clouds. Crickets were mocking me, chirping excitedly until I got close, then going quiet. Off in the woods, an owl made its presence known. Jacob! I called quietly, trying to keep my voice down. The wind picked up more, passing over me like a ghost, lifting my hair and playing with it. I gripped the fork's handle and held it against my side, trying to steady my trembling hands. Is that you? I heard Jacob's voice. A second later, he appeared from the darkness on my left, pale in the dim moonlight. What are you doing out here? Why do you have Ma's spade fork? Jacob. I was so overjoyed to find him. I almost dropped my weapon to give him a hug. The knot that had been tying itself in my stomach slackened and a tremor ran through me as I relaxed a little. I need your help. What's going on? Is it Dad? No, the Scarecrow. Jacob looked naturally puzzled. The Scarecrow? What about it? I'll show you. I looked around. Where is it? You're going to get your eye tanned. You know that, right? He saw the determination on my face and shrugged. Fine. It's this way. Jacob turned on his heel and disappeared among the tall crops. I hurried after him, keeping just a step behind, as he took his long strides down several rows. Then he stepped aside, gesturing in front of him, and I stopped dead in my tracks. There was the old cedar post, hammered into the ground decades before I was born. There were the old boots, dangling from the straw-stuffed pant legs. There was the checkered shirt, the sod-covered gloves, sticking straight out in what I always felt was a disrespectful mockery of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There was a burlap head with its mouthless face and big black shoe button eyes. And as my gaze fell upon that expressionless face, I watched in horror as the head slowly tilted down and turned to look directly at me. In that instance, I knew I was locking eyes with Satan. I started whispering a prayer to myself, even as I felt my bladder give up the ghost and a sudden warmth run down the inside of my leg. Jacob stood beside me. There it is. What are you planning to do? I had less than a moment to consider the question. The scarecrow looked from me to Jacob, then down at the spade fork in my hands, and seemed to realize what my intentions were. It reacted violently, straining against the straps that bound its arms to the perch. I could hear the old hemp ties creak in defiance. With only a moment of hesitation, I raised the fork, tucked the end of it under my shoulder, and drove it up into the scarecrow with as much force as I could muster. The ten-inch steel tines cut through the overalls and shirt with ease, burying themselves in the scarecrow's torso and stopping only when they hit the post on the other side. In response, the scarecrow lurched like it was in agony. Twisting so hard, I lost my grip on the fork. A sound came from its burlap head, a pained, muffled mimicry of a human screaming. Jacob, help! I yelled. The fork handle swung toward me, and I barely managed to get a hand back on it and pulled. The scarecrow screeched again in its human-like voice, jerking as the fork slid from its belly, slick black with blood. Before I could do anything, I plunged the sharp tines into it, again further up where I thought, certainly, the devil's heart would be. It didn't go as smoothly the second time, as blood was running down the handle. 
gracing my hands. The other tines caught on something along the edges, stopping me from pushing the fork all the way in. It didn't matter, though. The scarecrow's thrashing and spasms were already weakening. Jacob! I was hysterical. Everything was getting dark, and I felt the first drops of rain hit me on the head as I tried to retain my grip on the fork handle. One more push, just for safe measure. The scarecrow convulsed, its hands flapping in their binds. Its feet went limp and sloughed off the perch, one at a time, leaving it to hang by its arms. The red checkered shirt was stained dark with blood, and it was running down the tines and over my hands. The burlap head sagged down in defeat. I knew I was victorious. I turned to look at my brother. Did you see that? But Jacob was gone. Jacob? I could hear him running, his feet thumping in the dirt. Was my big, brave brother actually a coward in the face of Satan? But then I realized the footsteps were getting closer, not more distant. And it wasn't my brother who appeared suddenly, brushing aside the tall stalks. It was Pa. What's going on out here? He wore an expression of concern. But when he saw the scarecrow with Ma's spade fork hanging out of it, his eyes got big as saucers, and the scarlet tinge of anger returned to his face. What did you do? I had to stop him, I explained. He had the devil in him. What did you do? My father repeated again and again. He was spiraling into a rage of madness like I'd never seen, and I couldn't understand why. It's the devil, Pa, I said meekly. I saw him fornicating with Ma in the barn the other night. Pa grabbed the fork's handle and yanked it out of the scarecrow. I thought for sure he'd have a go at Satan himself when he heard what I'd just said, but instead he threw the implement off into the field and started putting his hands on the scarecrow's chest, pressing down and just saying over and over, My boy, my boy. I'm okay, Pa. But he wasn't listening to me. Propping the scarecrow's body up against his chest, he undid the binds on the wrist and let it slump over his shoulder. He turned and knelt, cradling it like a baby, then set it down on the soft dirt where it just laid there like a rag doll. The rain was picking up, coming down in a patter as he unbuttoned the neck of the scarecrow's shirt and started pulling the head off. Underneath was Jacob. He had a thick kerchief tied around that covered his mouth. It was dark with blood, and more was running down his chin and cheek. His eyes were open, but they didn't seem to be looking anywhere in particular, like he was lost in thought. But I saw Jacob. I couldn't finish my sentence. Ma appeared behind me, grabbing my shoulder tightly. What's the commotion? Is it Jacob? Pa was rocking back and forth, cradling Jacob in his arms and sobbing. I'd never seen him cry before. Oh, Jacob! Oh, my boy! Ma screamed, her howl piercing my brain, her fingers digging into my shoulder so hard she almost pushed me to my knees. Not Jacob! Oh, Lord, please, not my baby! She collapsed beside Pa and started stroking Jacob's hair and kissing his forehead. He's okay. Oh, my baby, he's going to be okay. I covered my ears to drown out their wailing, pulling so hard they felt ready to tear off. I felt the sting of warm tears fill my eyes and run down my face. This couldn't be Jacob. Jacob had been right there with me. He had led me to the scarecrow. I'd seen him. Only it hadn't been Jacob. Jacob had been where he always was when Pa put him in the field, done up in the scarecrow's clothes to hide his harsh punishment from judgmental neighbors, forced to think on his sins. It was where he had been when Ma had gone to find him 
and comfort him, her big, strong son, who reminded her so much of Pa before he became so cold and cruel with bitterness and age. He was where he was when he and Ma had eventually found comfort in each other. I had never known and could not understand, for at the time I was too young. No, it hadn't been Jacob that led me there that night. It had been Satan. Satan beat me after all. He used my family's sins to destroy us. Our tears, Jacob's blood, my parents' inconsolable wailing, clutching each other, and their dead son. It all mixed together in the rain and thunder and earth. There it was, a fragment of the universe hurtling through the cosmos. And there I was, gazing up from the comfort of a farmhouse rooftop, built by my father's hands, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. In all the years we lived out there in the countryside, not a damn thing remarkable ever happened. This meteor shower was the highlight of my entire life, and that's why with a bit of wonder glazed over my eyes, I wished on that one shooting star brighter than the rest. I wished for some excitement. Almost as if in answer to my plea, the meteor took a U-turn and fell from the sky like a falcon diving for its prey. I watched, astonished, as it passed overhead and crashed into the wooden area behind my dad's property. Surprisingly, there was no sound, no explosion, just the rustling of tree leaves as it plummeted through the forest's canopy. To make matters more peculiar, I swear I could see a red glow emanating from the crash site, however faint. After the initial shock wore off, I climbed down from the roof and raced into the woods as fast as my scrawny legs would allow. I had a rough idea where the thing landed, so I darted in that direction, hoping I could take home a chunk of space rock as a souvenir to show my father. If I was lucky, it would be a treasure thrilling enough to keep him from getting mad that I went off into the woods by my lonesome. I could only hope. Eventually, I came to a small clearing where the moonlight gently caressed the earth, granting me a somewhat clearer picture of the flora and fauna around me. I noticed many small animals frantically scurrying north for no discernible reason. I surmised that the meteor's landing frightened the wildlife nearby, and so I decided to head off in the opposite direction. Sure enough, after maybe ten more minutes of my impromptu hike to the wilderness, I came upon the source of the mysterious red glow I'd seen before. There was no meteor. There, sitting in a small depression in the ground, was a metallic pod of sorts, complete with a blinking beacon protruding from its surface like an antenna. The craft itself was spherical and at least twice my height. I'd never seen anything like it before. I was utterly dumbfounded. Before I could take a closer look, a hatch opened up from the side, startling me back into the woods. With a racing heart, I scuttled behind the nearest tree. I cautiously positioned my head around a trunk and spied on the object with bated breath. I didn't know what to expect. Was it some kind of top-secret military weapon? Or perhaps a remote-controlled gadget built by a genius hermit living nearby? Or would a little green man step out to greet me, demanding to speak to my leader? No matter the outcome, my eyes were glued to the metallic pod, for better or for worse. A dark violet ooze spilled from the object, forming a large puddle at its base. The slimy substance then scaled the pod, coating the exterior from top to bottom. As the slime moved around the sphere, the light above stopped blinking. All at once, the purple liquid was repelled from the craft and back onto the ground below. There it began taking on a more humanoid shape. 
As the ooze changed, so did its color. It became white and fuzzy, not unlike television static. Appropriately enough, TV and radio dialogue soon filled the forest. This thing was collecting signals from thin air, regurgitating lines from popular programs long since broadcast. At least, that's what it appeared to be doing. My mouth agape in awe, I began leaning forward without realizing it. The signals ceased abruptly, and I fell headfirst you know, onto a pile of dead branches, creating a loud crunch. From my new vantage point, I watched the white figure turn in my direction. I then heard it speak. Who's there? Its voice was shaky and unnatural, a low monotone growl coupled with a harsh reverb. Scared for my life, I picked myself up and ran back home, faster than I had ever run before. I reclaimed my perch on the roof and carefully surveyed the property. Once I was sure I hadn't been followed, I hopped through my bedroom window and climbed into bed, hoping that I dreamed the whole thing up, an adventure concocted by my imagination running wild. I wish it were that simple, but wishful thinking rarely plays out in one's favor. The following day I came downstairs to the familiar aroma of eggs and bacon. My father always cooked up a hearty breakfast on Sundays. The sight I was greeted with upon entering the room, however, was anything but familiar. There, sitting at a table across from my father, was a man in a clean-cut suit, wearing a bowler hat and a striped tie. We rarely entertain visitors, so I was more than a little perplexed. Son, this is Mr. Grovewood. His car broke down a couple of miles up the road, so he's going to be staying with us for a few nights until he can get things sorted out. How do you do, sport? I remained silent, perturbed by the man's presence and still shaken from the previous night. He's paying us a generous sum to stay here, so you best treat him with respect. My dad glared at me in a way that effectively relayed his meeting. As such, I complied. I I'm well, sir. Thank you for asking. The man smiled, albeit awkwardly, and I ran off outside to tend to the farm. I didn't know why, but I'd suddenly lost my appetite. Something just wasn't adding up. How did this stranger find the farm after his car broke down? We were literally surrounded by forest. Dumb luck, perhaps? I'm doubtful. I was beginning to feel that his appearance the day after that thing landed in the woods wasn't a mere coincidence, but this wasn't a theory I had enough nerve to explore. After all, I'd already convinced myself that the previous night's events were nothing more than a bad dream. The man would be gone in a few days either way, so I tried not to dwell on it. The next couple of nights were bizarre. Mr. Grovewood attempted to watch a sitcom with us while eating dinner, but his reactions were less than normal. He seemed confused by the program and would only laugh after he noticed us laughing. And this wasn't just any laughter, mind you. It was a loud guffaw of intensely uncomfortable proportions. I was almost relieved when he got pulled away by a phone call from a business colleague though I didn't hear a single word exchanged. The following night I walked downstairs to the kitchen for a glass of milk, only to find Mr. Grovewood chawing down on a raw steak from the freezer. I asked him about it, and all he said was, "That's eh, just a little midnight snack. Trust me, the color does the body good. Needless to say, I ran back to my room in a hurry without my glass of milk. Last night, however is when I became truly afraid. Walking past the guest room to get to the bathroom, I overheard Mr. Grovewood on the phone. This time I heard him speak. Did you receive the information I transmitted? <laughs> yes, this is the language we must use from here on out now. We must avoid suspicion and blend in with the rest. Oh, it's a lovely place. Rich in minerals, water, and life forms. You and the others are going to like it here. 
As long as you're ready. There's no going back from here. This will be our new home. No need. Why waste the material on transports when I can beam you down instantaneously? I have two vessels here, ripe for the taking. Her first coherent thought for today. How surprisingly pleasant. She was entombed between impossibly white walls in a haven of filth. Cold to the touch of her cheek, should she choose to rest against them, sending a chill rushing through her flesh and deep into the marrow of her bones. Her bonds are tight and reeking, though she has grown accustomed to the stench of filth, barely masked by the odor of piss weak bleach. But those walls again, possibly white walls, in a haven of filth only because she pictures them so. The fuzziness of a drug-induced weariness begins to lift, and she momentarily recalls that she is in the Oddsley House Adolescent Home for the Emotionally Troubled, a polished and overly polite title, for what is, in essence, an asylum. She hears the hurried click-clack of plastic heels on a tiled floor, accompanied by insistent, plim-soled shuffles. Today there are two of them, maybe three. Her cell, windowless and secure, does little to keep out external sounds, be they cries of others like her, or the squeak and squeal of the approaching wheelchair, attempting to gain traction. They come for her now, of that she's certain. Their gait shows no sign of slowing. They will not be stopping at some other unfortunate's door this day. How long was it since their last visit? She struggles to recall. The passage of time is all but immeasurable beneath the constant artificial glare of the solitary humming strip light above her. The turn of a key, the twist of a handle, the squeal of a metal door opening. Before her, three silhouettes, familiar in shape. The gleam of the metal wheelchair catches her eye, and for a moment, she sees stars dancing atop its surface. A rain-sodden street, devoid of any remarkable landmark. Badly lit, the road riddled with potholes. The ass end of a town that nobody admits to living in. A van, white beneath the sheen of accumulated traffic filth, parked where the fence that runs the length of the street stands mostly vertical. Though unlit, careful observation uncovers three shapes sitting inside, their vigil long, their patience tested. Another figure is visible now, the first to enter the street in many hours. This solitary figure hurries beneath the downfall, coat buckled tightly in a bid to keep the winter's rain at bay. The patience of the three is further rewarded, as fog has settled as if almost on cue. Should any altercation occur on this street at this time, none watching from their window would ever know. The passenger door to the van opens. The driver's door follows suit. Two figures step out of the van and into the fog. The figure hurrying along the street hears the doors open, but not close. If unnerved by this, the stride does not betray, for the pace remains steady. He, or she, the gender's not clear, passes by the figures in the van without hesitation and without acknowledgement. The two figures from the van follow after, and within a couple of strides, the three walk side by side. There is a brief scuffle. Angry words are exchanged. The voice registering surprise is that of a woman. She breaks free from the melee and begins to run. She's light on her feet, but one of her attackers, the slender one, is able to match her speed. With a deft flick of the wrist, he extends the shaft of a police baton, and when he's within range, strikes the woman on the back of her head. She falls to the ground with an unbecoming grunt. 
For a moment, the two pursuers stand next to her. No words are exchanged. One can only assume that the enormity of the situation weighs on their minds, if only momentarily. For soon, their men handling her back into the back of the van, a sack now secured of her head, a sack with a frowning face daubed in red. The other person from the front of the van, the one that abstained from the chase, now stands by the open doors at the back of the van. A roll of duct tape is passed to the one colleague who's entered the van with a woman. A squill of tape being unrolled echoes along the street, but none are around to hear it. The van, now with four occupants, one reluctant, is parked, lights off, motor cooling, in a quiet residential street. There is no derelict fence lining the pavement, nor a myriad of potholes. The fog has lifted. Sean wonders if this neighborhood is above the fog. Toby turns to his sister, who sits occupying the middle seat. Are you sure this is the right address? She produces a crumpled piece of paper from her pocket and switches on the light beside the rearview mirror. The letters on the paper appear smudged from an earlier episode of Tears. She wonders whether they were born of anger or fear. Yep, she says, stuffing the piece of paper back into her pocket and wiping her nose on the sleeve of her coat. Looks to have done pretty well for himself, doesn't he? Asks Callum the third member of the kidnapping collective. Yeah, yeah, he does, mutters Toby. The bastard. He turns towards his sister, aware of her anxiety. Are you sure you want to go through with this? We can switch to plan B. It, it, it's no problem. Sean nods, looking straight ahead. I'm fine. The three of them exit the van, ignoring the muffled groans and dull clunks emanating from the back of the van. Without a word uttered between them, they approach the house they'd been observing for the last half hour. A typical two up, two down, detached with white walls, tall iron gates, an immaculate garden, and a double garage. It's set back further from the street than other nearby houses, perhaps indicating the owner's desire for privacy. This would only aid the kidnapper's efforts and had not gone unnoticed by Toby. He and Callum break away from Sean to source entry via the back door. Sean, her fear rising, stands before the polished plastic of the innocuous front door and raises her finger toward the doorbell. It's too late in the day for callers, thinks Robert Osterbury, as he digs his fork into his tray of takeaway food. The television has his attention, or at least it did until the doorbell chimed. He's watching pornography. The doorbell chimes again. Annoyed, Robert tosses his fork into his food, passes his plate aside, and stands. One moment, he calls as he shuffles into the hallway. The doorbell chimes a third time. Hold your horses, will you? He says as he slides aside the numerous bolts that secure his front door. I'm not as sprightly as I once... The door is ajar, and before him stands a girl, young, twenty-something, slim and gaunt. A flicker of recognition sparks somewhere in his mind, before her startled expression quickly rustles back his full attention. Yes. What is it? It's very late. The girl takes a small but altogether noticeable step away from him. I'm really I'm sorry to call it this, lazy huh? At this late hour, she begins, fumbling over her words. To Robert, her apology sounds forced, and her sincerity lacking. It's just my, my car has a flat tire, continues the girl. And I need to borrow a phone. Could I use yours, please? I'll be quick. Robert scrutinizes her eyes, searching for truth and finding none. He peers past her and into the street. Where's your car? I can take a look at it, if you like. The girl shifts on her feet and looks to the rain-sodden paving slabs. It's around the corner. I don't have a spare. Stupid of me, I know. I'll just take a quick call to get someone out. I have decent breakdown insurance. 
Did you try any of the other neighbors? asks Robert, his ears tuned for deceit. Uh, yes, I did, actually. A pause. The rain's barely falling at all and just seems to almost hang in the air as a fine mist. Robert decides she's not going to offer an explanation without a prompt. And? he asks, awaiting her next installment of fiction. And nobody answered, not one. She looks at him with eyes convinced that she is sold in her lies. His interest piqued, he stands aside. She needs no further invitation. Yeah, I suppose she can't be too careful these days, he says as she moves past him into the hallway, her scent filling his nostrils. You never know who's standing on your doorstep. She stands in front of him, unsure as to where to go. He motions to the door on his right and nods. The phone's just through there. Sean pretends to die. Behind her, sitting in his chair, is one of the men who haunts her nightmares. He sits, stuffing his face with Chinese food, oblivious to the danger which has come knocking on his door this night. Her eyes glance toward the dated, dusty television set, sat atop a chunky VCR. At least he's had enough courtesy to pause the filth in the screen. Yes, uh, hello, says Sean, beginning her fake call. Goodwin? Uh, Mary, uh, ST37YD. Uh, I don't have that. It's at home. Look, I've got a flat tire. Can you get anyone out to me? A sudden, prickling sense of being watched. She turns to look at him. He's grinning at her, a greasy, sickening smirk. Noodles dangle from his lips, and she feels his stomach lurch in disgust. Behind him, in the corner of her eye, she sees the door to what she guesses to be the kitchen open. Did my mask slip? I don't think so. Back to the act. Oh, that's great. How long? No, that's fine. Thank you ever so much for your help. She pretends to hang up and places the phone back onto its cradle. Thank you. They're sending on someone out to me. No problem. Startled, she turns to see him standing right in front of her. She hadn't heard him move, but then she never did. She moves toward the hallway. I'll get out of your way now and leave you to your, well, your evening. They know where you are, then? He asks, following after. Yes, they'll be here soon, she says, fumbling with the latch securing the front door. Only you never gave an address. Another awkward pause as Sean mentally searches for an explanation. Her mobile phone emits a beep from her jacket pocket. She produces it with a flourish. They can um, track me using this, she says, her voice leadened with relief. Oh, says Robert, his eyebrows arched. Isn't modern technology fantastic? She does not answer. She's out the door and almost to the gates. But tell me, uh, why didn't you use your mobile phone to call them in the first place? Sean closes the gate behind her and pauses to look back. She has no answer, and he has plenty. The back door is open, as planned. Sean steps into the darkness of Robert's kitchen. Poised ahead of her, balaclavas on, Toby and Callum stand either side of the door. Watching as Callum initiates a silent countdown with his hand, she struggles to smother a smile as she thinks back to the soldier games they played in the home back when... just back when. On Callum's signal, Toby eases open the kitchen door and creeps silently into the living room. Callum follows immediately behind. Sean had earlier agreed to remain behind, safe and out of sight, but the urge to watch overcomes her and she moves toward the open doorway, just in time to see them make their move on Robert. Toby stuffs a sock into Robert's mouth and duct tapes it into position. Callum places a sock over Robert's head and tightens with a drawstring, a sack hood with a painted sad stickman face. Their prisoner makes no effort to stand, allowing Toby to tape his hands without so much as a struggle. Sean feels that Robert's surrender came too easily, almost as though he knew they were coming for him. Impossible. It's been years since... 
It's been a long time. The three of them march Robert out through the back door alongside the house and out into the street. He goes willingly and without protest, his head bowed, his steps even and measured. Sean watches, following further behind. Is this a man accepting his fate? She wonders, perturbed at his eagerness to comply. Or is this a man terrified for his life, trying in vain not to anger his captors? Either way, it matters little. His fate was set, as was that of the woman now sitting upright in the back of the van. Her crude sack face turns to greet them as Callum opens the doors. The sight of her unsettles Sean momentarily, for she recalls not only the face behind the mask, but her evil intent. Toby pushes Robert in the small of his back as he climbs into the back of the van, forcing him to the ground. Callum slams the doors shut. Toby removes his balaclava and winks at his sister. One more to go. She smiles at her twin, pushing aside all thought of a woman in the van. One more to go. She repeats her confidence returning by way of her brother's gaze. The acquisition of Captain Three was one suspect of the night's events that unnerved Sean the most, and though neither of them showed any sign, she understood that Toby and Callum felt likewise. The capture of Harold Mullins was the birthing of their entire plan. He was the cause of all their nightmares, all their suffering, all their scars. They all had reason to fear him. And yet, now, he would be almost seventy years of age. An old man, harmless, feeble, and incontinent. What threat could he possibly pose to three adults in the prime of their lives? Sean's reasoning did little to quell the sweat pouring out of her. She was glad that, in this instance, the boys had insisted that she stay behind in the van to keep watch over the other two prisoners in the back, and should she so desire, watch the live feed of Harold's kidnapping via Toby's hand cam. Several times that day, she'd asked herself if she was ready to face him. Knowing that she had to be, she ignored the answers screened by her conscience. All she knew for sure was that she was glad she wouldn't have to face him in his home. What about in the other home? That would be different. He'd be bound. He'd be helpless. He'd know how it felt. A world of green light and impossible shadows illuminates the screen of Sean's mobile phone as she journeys virtually with Toby and Callum through the interior of Harold's home. The familiar shapes of furniture twist and contort before the glare of the infrared camera. The images relayed appear to show an alien, almost nightmarish version of reality. There's no sound coming from the video feed, lending a further air of disconnection between what she knew to be happening and the events she was watching unfold on screen. Sean's pulse sounds loudly in her chest, beginning to raise in tempo as the boys climb the stairs and enter the upper floor. Harold's bedroom is quickly located. The door is ajar. Toby and Callum enter. The camera focuses upon a solitary figure lying atop of the sheets in a king-size bed. He's fully clothed and his eyes are open, staring straight up at the ceiling. Toby moves closer with the camera. Harold sits suddenly upright. His eyes stare straight into the camera. Sean jumps in her seat. Toby fumbles with the camera. The monitor screen goes blank. Many minutes pass as Sean nervously checks her watch, failing to register any sense of time. The video feed is blank. There's been no sign of life coming from within the house, and no sign of the boys returning. Suddenly, the van echoes with the sounds of the rear doors opening, and something heavy is deposited into the back of the van. Beside her, the passenger door opens, and Toby, his face masked in sweat, his complexion pale, gives her the thumbs up. Long drive into darkness. They pass no other vehicle on their journey. This road was always quiet, the location of the home, likely chosen for that very reason. Beyond Sean's window, rolling hills and barbed wire fences lost to the murk of night. 
further, little else, within twenty miles, aside from long-abandoned farmhouses and fields of creeping thistle. How Sean longs for the journey to continue, over all too quickly as the silhouette of Owdsley House appears on the horizon, igniting her fear once more. As Toby and Callum march each of their prisoners indoors, Sean remains by the van, content to observe, her eyes trained on the derelict hall, staying far away from the entrance, knowing that she must, but unsure all the same as to whether she'll be able to set foot inside. Three sad-faced, sack-headed individuals sit bound in a line to their chairs. None tries to speak. Toby walks along their line, his pace meandering, a smile on his face. Callum stands alongside Sean. She feels his desire to protect, though he knows only too well that she's been damaged beyond hope. The Great Hall, once the grand, polished, and lying face of the Oldsley House, is charred and riddled with graffiti. There is no art here. Only the scrawls of others traumatized by their time spent within her walls. There are prayers daubed in paint. There are obscenities daubed in feces. Any lingering remains of the home's professional visage have either been consumed by flame, hate, or both. Toby nods toward Callum, who steps forward and proceeds along the line of prisoners, removing their hoods. The woman, Fiona Crestwell, mascara smudged from tears long dried, winces at the light of the moon pervading through the exposed crossbeams of the collapsed ceiling. On noting Sean's expression, she adopts a forced expression of calm and even composure. Robert begins to whine and plead as soon as his sack's removed. Callum answers him by placing it back over his head. More increasingly, desperate pleas follow. Toby warns Robert to be quiet, who nods in agreement, and Callum removes his hood once more. Harold laughs as Callum removes his hood. A straight jab to the jaw silences his sniggers momentarily as he spits blood onto the scorched tile floor. Toby notices Sean take a step backward as Harold's hood is removed. Don't worry, okay? He whispers. They're all tied down. They can't do anything to us. Sean nods and offers a weak smile. Are you sure you're okay with this? Toby asks her, noting her reaction. Another nod from Sean. I I'm good. I can do this. I have to do this. She steps forward, occupying the space she retreated from moments earlier. I'll skip the introduction, she begins, her voice cracking slightly. We all know one another, even if it's been a few years since. Her voice trails off as memories of the last time she was alone with the three captives threaten to overwhelm her. How long exactly has it been? I'm curious. Eight? Nine years? Asked Harold through the bloody teeth. Fiona narrows her eyes and fixes them on Sean. Not long enough to wipe the memory of you three. Please, not this. It was a lifetime ago. Pleads Robert. Twelve, says Toby coldly. It was twelve years ago. Really? Says Harold in mock surprise. Is it that long? He turns to Robert, who's sweating profusely and threatening tears. Doesn't time have a habit of getting away from you? Please, begins Robert again, ignoring Harold. We've all moved on with our lives. We've all atoned in some way. Toby leans in close to Harold, wrinkling his nose in disgust. It felt like only yesterday to us. Please, untie me. Let me go. I've got money. A lot of money. Whatever amount you need, it's yours. Cried Robert, sobbing now. Please, I'm not that man anymore. You have to believe me. Callum approaches Robert. His fists balled tightly. Shut up. You want me to hit you too? Toby eases Callum aside, calming him with a look. Harold turns toward Robert, laughing. See, you made the guard dog mad. Bad boy. 
You always were a coward, hisses Fiona. But Robert has caught Toby's interest and continues, holding his gaze. No, no, no. It's not like that. I had nothing to do with any of this. You know, don't you? You remember. I think it's probably too late to try and talk your way out of this now, spits Fiona, anger marring her words. She eyes Sean, and any lingering trace of rage dissolves from her features. So, begins Fiona, her tone direct. Out with it. Who are you? You look familiar, but then we've had so many of you brats pass through our... Sean cuts Fiona off mid-sentence with a slap. Bitch! Fiona smiles, her cheek reddening by the second. You know, I thought it was you. You always did have claws. It was a shame we had to clip them. Fiona's words triggered a memory that at first merely teases Sean's senses before overcoming them entirely. Sean's restrained in a chair. Her surroundings are dimly lit. She sees exposed pipework and a row upon row of filthy cracked tiles. A smell of damp invades her nostrils. Before her stands Fiona, her features softer, her scowl minus the crease of middle age. And next to her, Robert, his frame less bulky, one hand down the front of his trousers. Harold approaches her from her right. He smiles that smile. Terror is all that she knows. You can shut it, too, threatens Callum. I'm not above hitting a woman. Sean, realizing that she's free from the chair, the memory and now back amongst friends, eyes Fiona, suddenly bold, suddenly angry. There ain't no woman, she calls to Toby, her eyes fixed on Fiona. Did you pack the pliers? Toby rummages through the hole all, produces a pair of needle-nose pliers, and tosses them to Sean. Check. Sean toys with them. Remember these? Fiona looks away in disgust. Hey, hey, Toby. It is you. I can't believe it took me this long to figure it out. I'm usually good with faces, begins Harold, his tone insistent. I recognize you now, the girl. Sarah, something rather, and you, dear big brother, ever the knight in shining armor. You were our only set of twins, you know. He laughs, loud, celebratory. Oh, I do love a reunion. Catching up, reliving the good old days. Harold's attention suddenly shifts to Callum. But you, boy, you I don't recall. You mustn't have made an impression on me quite the same way as my delightful twins did. Callum, livid, strides towards Harold, his fist raised, ready to strike him again. Toby intervenes. No, I want that prick conscious for a while yet. A moment to think, and Callum nods, lowering his fist. Harold, now taunting in a sing-song voice. That's right. Be a good boy and do as you're told. Robert catches Toby's eyes and resumes his pleading. Look, I've nothing to do with any of this. You know that, right? I never heard any of you. I never even touched you. No, you didn't, replies Toby, his eyes trained on Robert's pallid face, hate filling his world. And I said I've got money. I can pay you whatever you want. Just let me... let me go. I won't say anything to anyone, I promise. A beat of silence that seems to echo throughout the hollowed-out hall. One hundred thousand? asks Toby tentatively. Robert nods all too eagerly, his many chins quavering in unison. Sure, yes, of course. Toby, what are you doing? asks Callum. Sean turns to Callum. Shush. Each, demands Toby. One hundred thousand each. Robert's face flushes as he commits to the lie. Yes, of course. I can do that. It might take me a few days to raise the funds, but... You disgusting fat bastard, interrupts Fiona, her anger barely contained. Always out to save your own skin. You're as much a part of this as any of us. Robert directs his pleading away from Toby and towards Fiona. I didn't do anything. You know I didn't. Not like you. Toby stands in front of Robert, seizes him by his cheeks, 
and presses his forehead to his. That was always your problem, Robert. The two stare into one another's eyes, each breathing heavily. Robert's face drips with perspiration, his plates lost to his lips. Toby crouches to pick a broken brick end from the floor, meeting Robert's terrified gaze and passes the brick end from one hand to the other. You are right. You never did anything. You never did anything to stop it. Toby stands and raises the brick end above his head. Robert's shouts become louder. I can pay! I can pay for the love of God! Toby brings the point of the broken brick end crashing down into the top of Robert's skull, cracking his head open. Several violent blows later, and Robert's unrecognizable in his head, is a pulped mass of skull fragments and brain tissue. Any semblance of a face is lost beneath a mask of gore. Toby tosses the bloodied brick end to the floor, steps away from Robert's body, and turns towards Sean, grinning. His face and clothes are spattered with blood. Fiona turns away from Robert in disgust. Harold sniggers. Callum approaches Toby, shoving him hard to the chest. Toby! Bravo! coos Harold. I say bravo. I'd applaud if I could. My, that was impressive. Animal mumbles Fiona, her voice sounding uncharacteristically feeble. Callum shoves Toby again, almost causing him to fall backward. What the hell did you do that for? He asks, the artery in his neck bulging. Toby answers with a smirk and a defiant stare. There's no point trying to reason with him now, boy, interjects Harold. He's lost in the moment. He's savoring the kill, if you will. His attention switches from Callum to Toby. It feels good, doesn't it? Better than the best sex you've ever had, am I right? Callum turns toward Harold, utters a quick threat, and takes Toby aside, further from Harold's approving glare, a glare that Toby is all too willing to meet. Toby! Toby! Look at me, damn it! Toby obliges and meets Callum's eye. Toby! You know I've got your back on this. You know I'm all in. But this isn't what we agreed. This, this is just a mess. This is how it has to be, replies Toby, his expression blank. Harold's laugh echoes into the night. Callum fixes Harold with a glare of his own. Shut up, old man, or I swear to God. God, you say, snorts Harold. There's no God here. This place is in his blind spot, always has been. How else could we have played our little games all these years? Callum bombs across the floor and wraps his hands around Harold's throat, cutting him off again mid-sentence before Toby quickly breaks his grip. No! I already said not yet, not like that. He's poison, mate. You're no good listening to him. Callum turns towards Sean. Did you know? She stares blankly at him. Callum repeats the question. Tell me, did you know it was going to be like this? Of course she knew, answered Harold, struggling to regain his breath. Twins have no secrets, haven't you heard? Sean and Callum exchange looks. Callum is one of confusion and disappointment. Sean is riddled with silent apology. Fiona stirs and fixes her attention on Toby. If you're going to do this, spare me the melodrama and get it over with. I've made my peace with what I did. Toby turns to his sister, seeking her approval. Sean nods. Her next. A smile, all the more unnerving, caked in blood, forms on Toby's lips as he approaches Fiona. He stands in front of her, his shadow draping over her in darkness, his fingers flexing. She meets his glare, showing no hint of fear. How very noble of you, says Harold of Fiona. I must say, I don't recall you ever showing an ounce of regret. Not ever. Fiona mutters a curt answer. I didn't. She's a rare breed, that one, continues Harold, incapable of feeling anything. I must admit it. Uh, it gave me a kick knowing she was in on this. We shared many a moment reliving our exploits, didn't we, darling? Fiona's unable to reply because Toby's hands are clasped tight around her throat. 
My, my. Going for a more hands-on approach already. He really has developed an act for this, says Harold, his glee apparent. Callum, who's unable to watch his friend commit another act of murder, turns away and begins to pace the length of the great hall. Sean, motionless, watches on. I can't do this, shouts Callum, kicking a pile of debris across the floor. Sean answers without taking her eyes off her brother. You have to. We agreed. Callum sits with his back toward the others. Not to this, he mumbles. Not to murder. You knew, shouts Sean, suddenly angry. Yes, it was unsaid, but you knew. We all did. After what they did to us, they deserve this. So knock this weak crap off. Because we both need you. Toby steps away from Fiona's lifeless corpse. A silence, dense and accusing, settles in a room. You enjoyed that, didn't you? Asks Harold, his voice low, barely above a whisper. Toby, his shoulders heaving, smiles at Harold. <laughs> yes. Harold grins, his response posed more as a statement of truth rather than a question. And now you understand why I couldn't stop. I've had enough of your poisonous tongue. Royce Callum approaching Harold. He strikes the old man hard in the jaw. You were the cause of all this. Harold spits blood and smiles through broken teeth. You feel it too, don't you, boy? The feeling of absolute mastery over another. I bet you're all excited right now. Callum raises his fist to strike the man again, but something prevents him from doing so. Angry and unable to voice his frustration, he spits on Harold's face. I'm better than that. I'm better than you. Callum retreats to the rear of the hall and resumes his pacing. Toby quickly takes his place in front of Harold. Ah, my turn to meet the Reaper, says Harold with a laugh. I must say, the anticipation was killing me, almost. He peers around Toby to look at Sean. So, pretty lady, what have you and your brother cooked up for me? Toby produces a Stanley knife from his pocket. You'll be pleased to hear I've saved the best until last. Harold eyes the tip of the blade as it glints beneath the moonlight. His smile is quickly replaced by a look of concern. Look, I do hate to spoil your fun, but this has gone on quite long enough. The fact of the matter is, I'm not actually here. Callum pauses mid-step and turns toward the group. You really are crazy, aren't you, old man? Toby, if you're going to do this, and I'm fairly sure you are, do us a favor and start with his tongue so we don't have to listen to him anymore. Harold smirks. Well, you can try, my boy. You'll never get that blade within an inch of my flesh. Isn't that right, Sean? Something in the way he spoke her name transports Sean away from the burnt-out hall of Owdsley House and back into that chair in the basement, back in those restraints. Back to where Fiona stands scowling. Back where Robert stands with his hand down his pants. Back to where Harold moving towards her mouth with a set of rusty pliers. A familiar voice, Callum calling her name, and Sean is among the charred remains and corpses of Owdsley House once more. He calls her name again, but she doesn't answer. The taste of copper fills her mouth. Instinctively, she spits, and a single white tooth falls to the floor. Sean cups her mouth with her hand as a tide of blood gushes from her gums. Toby, oblivious of the plight of his sister, attempts to slice into Harold's face, but is unable to move the blade anywhere near him. Harold goads, and Toby's anger rises. I give up. I can't do this. I can't cut him. He turns to his sister. What's he on about, Sean? Why can't I cut the... His voice trails off as he sees the puddle of blood at his sister's feet and the tooth gleaming at its center. Sean! What's that? Callum is beside Sean, wiping her mouth, spearing blood across her cheek. What's going on? he asks, aiming the question at Harold. Did you do this? 
Toby tosses the knife aside and rushes to his sister. She smiles at him, a hopeless, confused, and bloody gap-toothed smile. That one came out without much encouragement, calls Harold from behind them. Let's try for one of the big ones at the back, shall we? And again, Owdsley House fades into nothing, replaced by that same dank cellar, the same restraints, that same numbing feeling of terror. This time, though, Sean cannot see Fiona or Robert, but she can hear his excited grunts. This time Harold's grinning face fills her vision as he pushes his hand further into her throat. Sean, her head jerks violently backward, tearing her body from Toby's grip. With a jolt, her head springs forward, emitting a torrent of blood in a single white molar. Now that one was in deep, shouts Harold in surprise. I had to work hard to get that loose. Toby embraces her sister, who is shaking with fright. Callum moves toward Harold, scooping the Stanley knife from the floor as he does so. What the hell's going on? You'll talk or I'll finish you here right now. I told you all, says Harold, matter of fact. I'm not here, and neither are you. Ask Sean why. She knows. Callum looks at Sean, his eyes pleading for an explanation. Toby places his hands onto his sister's shoulders and locks his eyes with hers. Sean, I know you're scared now. Hell, so am I. But what's going on? Sean shakes her head. She's at a loss to explain what's happening, and what little composure remains she's using to stop herself from fleeing Owsley House. She knows what's going on, crows Harold. Deep down, if she really thinks hard, she knows. She's just too afraid to admit the truth to herself, but it'll come. Not long now. Callum approaches Harold with the blade of the Stanley knife exposed. You'll need to give us more than riddles if you don't want to join your two friends here. <laughs> Quite impossible, laughs Harold. Were you not listening earlier? He nods toward Robert and Fiona. Besides which, neither of them is dead, not really. On hearing Harold's words, Fiona and Robert begin to stir and straighten in their chairs. Fiona, her flesh an unnatural shade of blue, fixes Callum with a knowing smirk. Robert, his head, a mess of gore and bone, begins to struggle and fight against his restraints. Oh, man, says Callum, slowly stepping away from Harold and his reanimated colleagues. The Stanley knife clatters to the floor. Toby turns toward the commotion while Sean, unable to comprehend what she's seeing, stumbles backward and falls. You see, they aren't dead, continues Harold to Callum. But you are, boy. I drilled your head open with a black and decker. Callum suddenly slumps to the ground, a stream of blood arcing high into the air from an unseen wound on his head. And you, says Harold to Toby, you I gutted like a fish. On hearing Harold's words, Toby's stomach opened right and left, and he sinks to his knees, his mouth open in silent protest, his entrails rushing to meet the seared floor. Sean crawls across the floor toward her kneeling brother, his breath shallow, his life fading, tears stinging her eyes, fear clouding her senses. Which just leaves us three and you, says Harold to Sean, shaking free his restraints and standing. Much as it has been the last few weeks. Let me ask you this. He crosses the floor, approaches her, kicks her brother to the floor, reaches down, and drags her to her feet. Are you done running now? Are you done running now? Sean's back in the basement, and the Owsley house is nothing more than a rapidly diminishing dream. Harold is in front of her, a pair of bloodied pliers in one hand. Fear takes hold of her, draining her of strength and thought, Fear, then pain, and her mouth feels tender, almost spongy. The taste of copper pervades. She's awake again, says Harold to Fiona and Robert, whose outlines are now barely distinguishable in the gloom of the cellar. Not sure for how long, though. A 
I wonder where she goes to in that head of hers. Asks Robert, is curiosity genuine? Who cares? Snaps Fiona. She's back now and it's about time. We better get on with it. It'll be morning soon. I'm not so sure, begins Harold, ignoring Fiona's insistence. The mind is fascinating, its reach is vast, especially under duress, which, little Miss Toothless here, has surely been. However, I have no interest in the mind, it's the flesh that we're concerned with. Sean, now all too aware of her predicament, tries to speak. Harold leans in close to her and scrutinizes his handiwork. You know, I don't like the way she's looking at me. What do you two think? Robert and Fiona emerge from the shadows, flanking Harold on either side. I'd say she's definitely not happy with you, agrees Robert. I was a prissy bitch, adds Fiona. Harold places the pliers to one side and picks up a sturdy hand drill. He leans in close to Sean once more. I think I'll take your eye. I'll make this sporting, though. I'm not a complete monster. Which would you prefer to keep? Left or right? Sean struggles against her restraints. She wants to cry for help, even though she knows that none will be forthcoming. These are her last moments. Of that, she's certain. Left, you say, asks Harold. Do you think she said she'd prefer to keep her left? Robert sniggers. Fiona smirks. Now, the consensus among us is that you'd prefer to keep your left. Sean utters a cry born of pain and anguish stifled by swollen, bloodied gums. Harold starts up the drill and moves the tip of the drill a bit towards Sean's face. Then the left one is the one I'll take first. I guess I'll start with an introduction. My name's Brendan Spirit. Actually, no. Sorry, no, it's not. I suppose I should be honest in case anyone actually finds this voice recording. My name, my real name, is Kermit Stainton. And before you ask, yes, I was named after the frog. And no, I don't want to talk about it. You can call me by my stage name, Brendan. Maybe you've heard of me. I'm an urban explorer. Not, uh, you know, a popular one, but still, I got a few followers. So, as an urban explorer, I go to abandoned locations with my video camera and record what I find. Usually, it is really cool or really sad. Sometimes it's scary, like when you hear doors slam on their own when there's no wind, or when you cross a violent squatter hiding behind a mattress with a combat knife in one hand and a 1974 Marilyn Monroe calendar in the other hand. Like that one time in Cimarron Hills, Colorado, in 2016. Uh, sorry, where was I going with that again? Right, urban exploration. So uh, I've done a few videos, uploaded them to all the social media sites the kids watch these days, and collected a bit of a fan base. By a bit, I mean about maybe 50 subscribers. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. But I've been doing this for six years and just couldn't seem to go viral. But I knew what I had to do. Obviously, nobody cared about investigating random abandoned trailers and warehouses in rural Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska. I needed to explore something big, something people have actually heard of before. So I spent all my savings on a plane ticket to Japan to explore the abandoned city of Tamioka. Turns out the Japanese authorities don't like it when you go to Japan to explore the abandoned city of Tamioka. I was escorted away from the premises pretty quickly, and I ended up going back home with no footage and no money. I was willing to do anything for views. That's how I ended up here. I was reading about abandoned places online when I came across a police report from 2009. A 26-year-old man from Rossi, Nebraska, named Kyle Hayes, had disappeared after leaving home one day for what was supposed to be a short hike. The police report mentioned previous disappearances in the area, but I couldn't find anything about them online. 
and so I did what anyone desperate for a mystery to solve would do. I packed up a few bags of supplies, got into my minivan, and drove to Rossi myself. When I say Rossi was a small town, that's a massive understatement. It was hidden so deeply in the middle of a sprawling forest that nobody could ever have accidentally stumbled across it. The sign coming into town was almost completely obscured by an overgrown pine tree branch, but I could make out the population of 204. That number was very believable. There was one gas station that I'm pretty sure was family-owned, a fire department with a post office inside, and a tiny grocery store along the road that took me into town. There were a handful of side roads that branched out into the residential areas, but as far as I could tell, they all looped around and came back to the main road eventually. Needless to say, this little town didn't have a library, which made my job significantly harder. I gave the post office a shot, hoping to find some form of public records in there. I didn't find any public records, but I did find a lovely elderly man named Elliot, who happened to know that the fire chief's father collected and preserved every newspaper published between 1939 and 2015. Not my idea of a fun hobby, but to each their own, I guess. I started with the edition featuring the disappearance of Kyle Hayes. Despite being in the headline for three weeks straight, there was very little information that wasn't in the police report except that Cal Hayes was an amateur hiker with a love for floriculture. The third week did have an interesting line, something along the lines of, the mountain has been a hot spot for disappearances for over a century, including that of poor young Sidney Francis in 1942, whose parents kept searching Trevino Forest until they disappeared too, sparking a local legend that the land is cursed. I went through every newspaper in 1942 until I found Sidney's case. He was a high school boy whose friends dared him to spend the night in an abandoned mansion hidden in the woods. I asked Elliot about the rumors in the mansion. He told me when he was a young man in 1978, some rich guy bought the house and renovated it, dubbing it Trevino Manor after the forest. But he disappeared a few months after completing the work, And instead of sending out a search party, the mayor at the time decided to tell everyone never to go into the woods ever again. It sounded like something out of a grim fairy tale. Abandoned mansions, cursed forests, spooky disappearances. It was a dream come true. I thanked the old man for his help and rushed off in the direction of the forest. It was nearly 5 p.m. by the time I left the post office. I wasn't worried, though. I wasn't much of a hiker, but if I could find the ruins of Trevino Manor, I'd be in my natural habitat, a rundown building in the middle of nowhere. I bought my backpack with my video camera, sleeping bag, flashlight, food and water, and obviously the voice recorder I'm speaking into right now. I was prepared to spend the night in the woods if I had to. I wasn't much of a camper, but I was confident in my abilities to survive one night in the wilderness. As I hiked, I kept checking my watch periodically. By 7.30 p.m., the sun was starting to get low, plunging the entire forest floor into darkness. I got out my flashlight and continued fighting my way between the trees and bushes. Occasionally, I'd hear something rustle around in the nearby foliage, but it couldn't have been bigger than... I don't know, like a porcupine? I could take a porcupine in a fight. Probably. 8.30 p.m. I had been stumbling over rogue tree roots and stray branches for hours now, with no sign of human life anywhere. Just as I was thinking about turning around and going back, as the last speckles of the sun that were poking through the canopy faded away, I finally came across a clearing through the trees that didn't look natural at all. A road. Or at least it looked like it used to be a road. The grass was growing through the loose gravel and dirt, and even if a few tree roots had started peeking out of the ground, I was certain that this was, ages ago, a road. 
pointed my flashlight up and down the road, trying to decide which way to go. The path couldn't have led to Rossi, or else the residents would have known about it, right? At least one person would have found it. So, no matter which way I went, it must lead to someone new, right? That seemed logical, but in my defense, I was exhausted and shouldn't have been allowed to make decisions unsupervised in the first place. For example, I should have brought a compass, but I assumed I would just know which direction I was facing all the time. I groaned at my own stupidity and decided to turn left. At least, if it led me back to town, I could spend the night in my car and start fresh in the morning. I walked down the abandoned road for ages before realizing I hadn't checked the time in a while. I shined the light on my watch display. 9.48 p.m. I had been on this path for over an hour and hadn't seen anything. Okay, I said out loud just to hear my voice. Twelve more minutes. Yeah. Twelve minutes, and then I stopped for the night. I aimed the light down the trail ahead of me. My legs felt like they were filled with peanut butter, but I forced them to march on. Almost immediately, as though it was waiting for a cue, something became visible in the distant shadows. The softest glint of light reflected from my flashlight's beam. A window, maybe. As I neared the anomaly... Something more notable came into view. A stone wall with a heavy iron gate. I gasped and squealed a little. It was too good to be true. It was like something out of a children's Halloween movie. The cracked wall was made of cobblestone and dressed from top to bottom in creeping ivy. The gate was secured by a thick rusty chain with the biggest, most cliché padlock I'd ever seen. The chain was loose enough that I could squeeze through if I took my backpack off. On the other side of the gate was an overgrown stone path leading up to a porch with a pair of towering wooden doors. About halfway up the house from the doors was an enormous round window, with its glass still somehow completely intact. The moonlight wove through the canopy and danced off the panes, allowing me to see the entire house in all its glory. It was as big as a fire station and the post office back in Rossi, and the walls were made of intricately placed wooden planks that were somehow still holding up after all this time. Some of the wood was warped, and almost all of it was padded with rich emerald moss, but I'd been in buildings that had only been abandoned for two years that showed more decay than this. It was extraordinary. A tiny part of me told me I should wait and come back when it was light out. The rest of me, of course, stomped that tiny bit to a pulp. Where was my sense of adventure? Doing this exploration at night and on the fly would make for a great video. I had to do it. I took my hiking backpack off and leaned it against the mossy wall outside the gate. The food and water was all sealed, so I wasn't worried about wildlife taking it away. I grabbed my camera and voice recorder, as well as some extra batteries for the flashlight, and stood up to face the gate. I switched on the camera and turned it toward my face, with way more enthusiasm than I should have been capable of after such a long hike. I started my video. Hey, friends, Brendan Spirit here with yet another exciting exploration for you. I flipped the camera toward the mansion and pointed a lens between the gate bars. I came all the way out to Rossi, Nebraska, to explore the mysterious Trevino Manor. The manor could be more than a hundred years old, and its rich history is being completely lost to time. Once a magnificent piece of architecture, today it sits forgotten by all, waiting to be finally taken back by Mother Nature's awesome power. Okay, so maybe I bs it a little. I needed a great catch to get people hooked. I couldn't just say that I rifled through old newspapers for a few hours after talking to an old dude at a post office. Nobody would want to hear about that. It would be so boring. I just had enough truth to invent a whole background for the place. I focused in on the front door and began slowly panning across the walls. Join me on this chilling investigation as we uncover the secrets of Trevino Manor. 
I zoomed out to show the gate as wholly as I could. This gate is all that stands between me and a world lost to time. Now, remember, I never enter a house if I have to break in. But lucky for me, I jingled the chain a little bit and gave one of the gate doors a heavy push. If I can fit through here without having to break anything, let's hope the doors are unlocked. I lowered the camera and stuck my right arm and leg through the opening. With a little bit of effort, I squeezed my head through and did a little dance to shake the rest of my body through. After brushing the flakes of rust out of my hair, I pointed the camera toward the mansion again. It looks like the front door is actually open a bit, I said. I looked at the viewfinder to zoom in on the door handle, but found that the screen had gone black. Confused, I pushed the power button. Nothing happened. How the hell? I'm under it. I was at 98% when I started recording, and my camera, as old as it was, normally held at least an hour of battery life while recording. I checked the power pack to make sure it hadn't come to loose, but it was as secure as always. I huffed and shut the viewfinder. I'd have to go back to my car and change the camera before I could record my video. My old-fashioned flip phone, straight out of the 90s, didn't have a camera on it, so I couldn't even use that to film. Don't make fun of me. It's got a battery life you wouldn't believe, and it's way more durable than the little glass tablets everyone's got now. Good for urban exploration. I guess my decision was made for me. I'd have to come back during the day. But as I slipped the Velcro grip off my fingers, I took another look at the manor. It was very old, and the forces of nature had definitely taken their toll on the old place. I'd sure hate to make that hike again just to find out the floors were too rotted for me to even walk on. I should at least check to make sure it was safe. I reached through the gate and set my video camera on top of my backpack. I wouldn't be gone too long. The camera would be fine. I checked my watch. 10.04 p.m. I didn't expect to be inside for more than half an hour. I climbed slowly up the two wooden steps to the door. They buckled a bit under my weight, but held up surprisingly well for their apparent age. Now that I was face to face with the ancient door, I got to see how much I had underestimated the workmanship from the other side of the gate. The door was solid oak, and the borders looked like they'd been carved by hand, showing a dog or cat of some kind chasing a rabbit. The tiny image repeated along the edges of both doors. The sturdy brass handles were shaped like twisting tree roots, which flattened into trunk-shaped metal plates, reaching upward toward the top of the door. In the canopy between the two trees, where the doors separated to open, was a carving of a silver clock split right down the middle. And, as I had seen from the gate, the door on the right had just been barely open. Not enough to see inside, but enough to know I could get in. I wrapped my hand around the cold handle and pushed. I was met with a lot of resistance. The door frame was sagging quite badly, causing the heavy oak door to scrape across the warped floor. When I finally got it open, though, and saw how beautiful the entrance hall was, I gasped deeply, and then I coughed up a lung. The place was full of dust, more than what I expected for a building that had been left to decay for decades. Normally abandoned houses, especially those made of wood, had gaping holes in the walls where panels had rotted away or caved in ceilings due to load-bearing beams giving way over time. The way the dust had settled told me there hadn't been any wind coming through here for ages, even through the crack between the front doors. Light, on the other hand, above the front door, moonlight poured through the massive window and flooded every corner of the foyer. The first thing I noticed was a grand staircase leading up to the second floor, with a glorious banister that morphed into a railing at the top of the steps and spread away from the stairs until they intersected with the paneled wall on either end of the room. On the back wall, directly above the top of the stairs on the second floor landing, was the biggest painting I'd ever seen in my life. It depicted a man, draped in red silk, 
with red beaded necklace hanging around his neck, a necklace that looks suspiciously like blood oozing from a slit throat. He was staring in horror at a strange dog-like monster flying over his head, while another man lay dying on the floor behind him, reaching toward the sky as though begging for the creature's mercy. Yeah, if you can't tell, I stared at the painting for a very long time. I was completely entranced. It hadn't flaked, wrinkled, or curled at all. It was like it was being protected from the elements by an invisible barrier. Even the colors, though a little faded, were still clear enough to make the painting stand out against the otherwise bland mix of grays and browns that made up the entrance hall. The indigo carpet leading down the stairs to the entrance was the only other color I could see, and even that looked dark gray under the layers of dust. I bent down to examine it closer. There were little silver swirls stitched across the blue, giving it an extravagant touch. I stood up and followed the carpet with my eyes. Through the archway to the right was a small parlor, complete with polished wooden stools at a smooth oak bar. Through the archway on my left, I saw a giant wooden table with ornate golden tips at the bottom of each leg. There were a few dining room chairs pushed in as much as they could be before the armrests collided with the side of the table. I didn't bother entering either of these rooms. By my guess, the dining room led into a kitchen and the parlor led into a smoking room. I'd get to those eventually, but not right now. I was more interested in seeing what was upstairs. I marched slowly up the stairs, careful to listen for any sudden cracking or snapping sounds. At the top of the stairs, the first thing I did was take a closer look at a painting. There was a tiny copper plaque that simply read, Kaya Fujin, but otherwise not much to go on. I wasn't sure if that was the artist, the title of the piece, or maybe just some classy graffiti. I tried to shake the image from my head and went on. The second floor had a few small bedrooms, all of which still had beds in them. A bathroom with an elegant marble floor and a clawfoot tub. A study with a desk that looked like it had been carved by Jesus himself. And to my utter joy, a library. It wasn't, you know... A big library, but it had six ceiling-high bookshelves lining the walls, which was six more ceiling-high bookshelves than I have in my home, and all of them were filled with books. The desk in the center of the room even had a quill, carefully placed next to a dried-up inkwell. The tall, arching window opposite the door completed the look. It was exactly what I would have expected a home library to look like. I scanned my flashlight across the dusty, leathery bindings of the books. There was something for every category I could think of, with topics ranging from poetry and geography to folklore and astrology. There was even an entire bookshelf filled with books whose titles were in letters I didn't recognize. Chinese? Japanese? Korean? Like seven different kinds of Indian? Pretty sure there were even a few in Hebrew. Whoever had collected the books must have been a master of languages. That or they bought the books on clearance just to fill a shelf. That didn't sound as romantic, though. Between two bookshelves, there was a ladder going up to what must have been an attic. I wondered if I should search that tonight or wait until I had my recording equipment when suddenly I heard a small creak coming from outside the library. Was I not alone? I tensed up and held my breath, listening intently for the next noise, but nothing came. After a few moments, I released my breath and let out a loud sigh. The building was from the 1940s, at the very latest. Of course, it was going to make sounds. I was surprised I hadn't heard anything before that. Relieved and suddenly exhausted, I lit up my watch with the flashlight again. 11.47 p.m., cursed quietly. I'd already spent three hours here. Three hours exploring an abandoned mansion without a video camera. What a waste of time. I could have just waited and recorded myself seeing everything for the first time the next day. 
But I had to satisfy my curiosity. Damn. I marched out of the library and turned down the hallway toward the grand staircase at the entrance. I'd only taken a few steps, however, when I heard another sound. This time it wasn't a creak, it was more like a dog whining. And it sounded like it was coming from the entrance hall. I froze again, straining my ears to hear more. Did a pack of wolves live here? Surely they wouldn't have let me go so long without coming after me. Hello? I called out. The house was quiet before I spoke, but now it was even more quiet. Like... Like... The voice in the back of my head finished the thought for me. Like someone who's been breathing the whole time you've been in here was suddenly holding their breath. The very moment the thought hit me, another noise came from the grand staircase. The rapid... Thump 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 footsteps racing up the stairs. I turned and ran back into the library, shutting the door behind me. I clicked the lock and ran to hide under the desk. I watched the door handle carefully as the footsteps neared the library door. Thump dum thump dum thump dum thump dum thump dum thump dum and I ran right past it. I didn't even release my breath this time. I was trembling too hard to breathe in or out. Why was I such an idiot? People kept telling me in the comments that I should get a partner to explore so I wasn't alone. Not that it would have helped me in this exact scenario, but at least a partner would have dragged my ass back to the car and made me wait until morning to look at the house. Okay, assess the situation, I thought. Is this an animal or a person? Probably a person. It sounded like it had two legs. I can outrun a person, right? Unless it's a ghost. Or a Bigfoot. No. <laughs> no, no jokes right now. It's a person, a regular human person. I just have to wait for the right time, then take off down the stairs and out the door. My camera and backpack. I'll come back for them in the morning with the police. Or at least with Elliot. The camera was $200. Not worth my life. Hell, I can buy a new camera, one from this decade. Ugh. I'm rambling. What time is it? I looked at my watch. 11.52 p.m. No more wasting time. I needed to leave right away. But just as I crawled out from under the desk, I heard the creaking of floorboards again. Was it coming back toward the library? I watched the moonlight seeping through the crack under the library door. Occasional creaks turned into soft, slow footsteps, which grew nearer and nearer. My heart dropped. A shadow slowly glided into view and stopped just outside the door. They knew where I was. My brain kicked into high gear again. I had no escape, except for the attic, but obviously, if they came into the library and saw that I was gone, the first place they'd check would be the only way out. It would be pointless. I'm not going to run. I heard a key slip into the door lock. I'm going to run. I stood up, not bothering to be quiet anymore, and leapt to the ladder going up into the ceiling. I reached the top of the ladder before I'd even registered that I was climbing. I rolled away from the opening and stopped on my back, sprawled out, looking straight up. The attic was the only room in this house that I'd found so far without a single window, and it was eerily evident. While the rest of Trevino Manor had been glowing with yellow-blue moonbeams, up here, above the library, I could see nothing but black. That's okay, said the optimistic part of my brain. If you can't see anything up here, they won't be able to see anything either. I wanted to believe that so badly. I remained flat on my back in the darkness for a few seconds before I finally heard the door lock click. They sure had taken their time turning the key. Were they waiting for me to hide? Or did they just want me to suffer more? I felt a tear roll down my face. A manly tear, I mean. And I begged that the stalker would somehow not see the ladder and just move on with their creepy-ass night. The muffled footsteps slowly made their way to the base of the ladder. My arms, which were covering my mouth so I wouldn't breathe, 
were trembling so hard I nearly threw up. But instead of hearing a hand on a rung, I barely heard an audible th- Then a few more soft footsteps away from the ladder, then a soft thud on the desk. They walked back toward the door. I heard it click shut, and then finally, I heard the key turn. The door was locked again. Relieved, I risked turning on my flashlight to look at my watch. 11.57 p.m. I didn't even have time to process that that was the longest five minutes of my life, though, because now that my flashlight was on, I could finally see my surroundings. This wasn't an attic so much as a hidden room. It was much smaller than the library was, barely big enough to fit me fully stretched out on the floor, as I was without hitting a wall. There was no furniture, no door, not even a vent, just a floor, ceiling, and four walls. Four walls all covered in word carvings. I looked closer. It was the same phrase carved over and over all across the walls, probably hundreds of times. Count the seconds. Watch the clocks. I might have been more curious or more creeped out, if the walls and I had met under better circumstances. But right now, I had more pressing things on my mind. I poked my head through the hole in the ceiling of the library and double-checked to make sure the coast was clear before quietly climbing down the ladder. It didn't take long for me to figure out what I had overheard the stalker doing. A book had been removed from a shelf and placed on the desk. It didn't have a title. The cover was plain black, with no lettering anywhere, even on the binding, just a dark red border along the front. I nervously looked at the light under the library door to make sure I was alone. Then I opened the book. It was blank. It was blank, and I was furious. What was the point? Why did the stalker put it here? Why would they even have this book? No, I was done. Time to leave. If I ran and they didn't catch me, I'd be free. And if I ran and they did catch me, at least I'd put up a fight. I looked at my watch. 11.59 p.m. I turned the manual lock on the door and swung it open. As I did so, I got a sudden rush of dizziness, as if I'd swung along with the door. I blinked to make the feeling go away. What I saw when I opened my eyes, I can't properly explain how I felt or how it happened. The hallway outside the library door was still there, but it wasn't the same as it was before. The walls had completely given into decay and were crippled over in some areas. A number of floorboards were missing entirely. Shocked, I took a step backward into the library again, and I fell right through the floor. I felt splintered wood slice into my head and arms as I tumbled down and collided hard with the dining room table below. I felt myself roll down a shallow incline before coming to rest on the damp, debris-covered floor. My body wanted to cough to clear the dirt from my lungs, but the wind had been completely knocked out of me. The only sound I could make was a loud, pained groan. I managed to roll over onto my side and forced a little wheeze, which turned into a cough, which turned into me nearly puking everywhere. When I finally recovered from the shock, I swept the debris from my hair and looked up. The library floor above me seemed to have rotted significantly since I opened the door. How was that even possible? Actually, looking around me, everything had changed in the same way. I hadn't even entered the dining room when I first entered the house, but I would have noticed if it looked like this. The walls were covered in mold and holes. The window in the center of the room was smashed to bits, and the table had collapsed to one side, intersecting with the floor right where I now lay. I clambered to my feet and limped into the entrance hall. The front doors were both missing, apparently torn from their hinges. The center of the floor had caved in, creating a pit about five feet deep. The long blue carpet that once started at the front door and ran up the stairs was now shredded in many places, either due to the passage of time 
or to some creature ripping it up. Speaking of creatures, I quickly drew my attention to the painting on the wall at the top of the stairs. The frame, though broken in a few places, still hung on the soggy wall. However, the canvas inside was completely missing. Instead, in the center of the frame, carved in giant sloppy letters, was the question, What time is it, Mr. Fox? I instinctively looked at my watch. Twelve a.m. Midnight, exactly. I looked back up at the carving for a moment, thinking back to a game I'd played with my friends when I was younger. I couldn't remember the objective of the game, but I distinctly remember shouting those exact words across the playground. What did they mean in this context, though? Before I got the chance to think about it, my memory was interrupted by a sound coming from the hallway at the top of the stairs. It was a creaking sound like before, but there was something else with it. A soft clacking noise like claws quietly tapping on the floor. It was coming from the hallway toward the bedrooms, but it was very clearly heading toward the entrance hall. My body jumped to full attention. I had to hide fast. I assessed my surroundings. Head outside and make a break for it? No, I'm not outrunning anything after that fall. Back into the dining room. No, I just made a ton of noise in there. That's the first place it'll look. Which leaves... I staggered across the entrance hall and into the parlor just as the sounds rounded the corner and onto the landing. The room was almost completely empty, but the one thing I had hoped for was still standing. The bar. I rushed around the far end of the bar and dropped to the floor. Bits of broken mirror and shattered glass bottles dug into my palms and knees, but I bit the inside of my cheek and swallowed the pain as I dragged myself the rest of the way to the wall. I strained my ears as I listened for the beast's footsteps. To my relief, it didn't seem to be interested in coming down the stairs at all. Rather, it continued across the landing and turned down the hallway above the dining room toward where the library was. When it was almost too distant to hear, the sound suddenly stopped. My eyes were closed tightly, my bloody hand covering my mouth and nose so I wouldn't give myself away by breathing. Everything was completely still. There wasn't a sound in the entire forest. But then, was there something in front of me? Was I being watched? After a few seconds of perfect silence, I decided to open my eyes just a crack. I was alone. I lowered my hand to let out a shaky breath and smiled for just a moment. Thud! The sound came from the dining room but echoed through the house, seemingly causing the structure itself to jump in fear. It was immediately followed by a quick clack Clack-shk, clack-shk, of paws, from upstairs, charging down the hallway toward the entrance room, scampering down the grand staircase, and bounding out the front doors into the forest. When I could no longer hear the gravel shaking under the monster's feet in the distance, I finally crept out from behind the bar. I had so many questions. Why had the house encountered fifty years' worth of decay in an instant? What did that kid's game have to do with it? And perhaps the most pressing of all, what was that thing? Could it be something supernatural? Or was it just a regular animal like a wolf? Or if it was a wolf, how did it not fall through the floorboards? I was back in the entrance hall now. Hiking through the woods at night with that thing on the loose would mean certain death. I was better off using Trevino Manor as shelter until morning. I checked my watch. 12 a.m., midnight. I tapped the watch and let out an angry puff of air. Damn thing must have broken into fall, I thought. That's fine. All I had to do was wait until I heard birds chirping. Then I'd know the sun was coming up. But as long as I had time, what then made that noise out in the dining room? I jogged past the open front doors toward the dining room. Resting on the floor, right where I had landed earlier, was a book. 
Actually, it was the same blank book that the stalker had placed in the desk. The animal must have knocked it down and spooked itself. I picked the book up and brushed the dust off. It was definitely the same book. The cover was plain black except for the red border, and there wasn't a single mark anywhere on it, but the binding felt looser, and the pages seemed a little ruffled. I opened it up to the first page. It was filled with writing like someone had used it as a diary. Actually, as I flipped through the pages, I saw that quite a lot of people had used it as a diary. The first few pages were written in very neat cursive. The author claimed to be stuck in an eternal night, waiting for a sunrise which never came. He said he had seen a woman wandering the halls of the estate the previous few weeks, and suspected witchcraft was at play. He ended the entry by saying that if he woke up and the journal was still empty, he'd know it was a dream. The next author had somewhat sloppier handwriting, with the swirls between the letters pointing all over the page and intersecting with the lines above and below the words. He said the same thing, that morning should have come hours ago, though he mentioned that he didn't have any way to keep track of time because his watch had stopped working. He expressed interest in who the previous writer was and what happened to them. I skimmed through the rest of the book. I saw entries from at least 20 different people. The earlier ones were along the same lines as the first two I read. Some mentioned a woman, some mentioned clocks not working, some mentioned an animal watching them from the shadows. That creeped me out. But all of them had the same theme. Night came and never left. The further I got into the book, though, the shorter the entries got. Most of them confirmed that everything the others had written was true. Few of them pondered if the woman was a manifestation of the devil, and some thought she was an angel of God, or even a vessel for God himself. Herself? Themself? You know what I mean. The last entry, though, was very thorough. It even started with a date. April 24, 2017. The writer introduced herself as investigative journalist Amy Shevka, and explained that she had come to Rossi to investigate the disappearance of someone named Martin Duchenne. She said Martin's wife, Josephine, had called her newspaper because the police weren't investigating at all. I thought that was strange, since I hadn't seen anything about the disappearance online when I was doing my research. I had a terrible feeling that was probably because Amy Shavkar never made it back to her editor-in-chief. Amy was very detailed, I expected, nothing less from a journalist, of course. She explained that she went into the house to investigate after seeing someone walk past the window. Thinking it could be Martin Duchenne, she searched the house but found no evidence of anyone living there. She decided to spend the night inside and head back to town in the morning. But she woke up at midnight in a considerably more rundown house than she had entered. In her sleep, Someone had set the book next to her. She said the world felt dead. The moon and stars didn't move across the sky. The wind didn't blow. And there were no sounds of birds or insects among the trees. Even the house itself wasn't creaking or shuddering anymore like it had, frozen in time overnight. Amy was very astute. I'll save you some time and tell you that's exactly what happened. She had taken time to explore the mansion and found the words, What time is it, Mr. Fox? Carved under walls throughout the place. She theorized that one of her predecessors had gone mad and started writing it, but she wondered why it was that specific phrase. She spent a considerable amount of time in the library, again exactly what I expected from a journalist, and found a book about the occult describing supernatural entities that she had never heard of before, and specifically, how to summon them. Along the side of the page, she wrote the words, Nish Hediku, or however it's pronounced, with a little question mark next to them. There was another break in the writing, and this time, when it returned, it was rushed, sloppy, and not nearly, uh, what's the word, elegant, 
as her other entries. She scribbled that she was being tormented by a creature that was hunting her from afar. She'd occasionally hear it scream from deep in the woods and described it as woeful and terrified, like a mother who'd just lost her baby. But she thought the cries were getting closer every time she heard it. Amy had found a makeshift fire pit in the woods and decided to make it her own. She thought she'd seen the beast at one point as well, a hulking, sleek shadow dashing past the trees, just at the edge of her campfire's glow. It was faster than any animal she'd ever seen, especially considering how gracefully it weaved through the thick trees. She admitted that it was possible she'd imagined it, though, as she'd been thinking about the term Mr. Fox a lot. One more break in the writing, and then, written in giant letters across the next page, just one word. Left. I instinctively looked over my left shoulder before realizing that was probably not what she meant. Was it a password? Was she saying she was left behind? Had she left? Did it stand for something? I wouldn't have minded a little more clarity with my clues. The rest of the book offered none. It was empty. So I could tell you how long I freaked out about that, if my watch had been working. But since nobody can prove otherwise, uh, we'll say I accepted that this was the truth immediately and started working to solve my problem. And my plans to solve the problem definitely had nothing to do with going back into the parlor and crying in the pile of glass behind the bar. So, having accepted that I was frozen in time and being chased by Mr. Fox from the children's playground game, I formulated a plan. First, I went to the library to try and find the book Amy Shikard referenced. Unfortunately, most of the library was in the dining room. It seemed two bookshelves had dropped through the giant hole in the library floor and smashed bits in the ground. Any books that had fallen on the floor looked like they'd been submerged in water for a small period of time. The covers that survived were so warped I could barely make out what they were, and even then the pages were basically paste. In the library itself, there were still four bookshelves standing tall. Most of them didn't have any books left in them, which made me wonder how Amy managed to spend so much time here. Those that did... One was about the history of the taiga, which, judging from the cover, was a big snowy forest. Uh, one was about brain chemistry from the late 1970s, so not exactly up to date. One was a children's book about a baby dinosaur eating grapes. And then there were a few math books. Nothing helpful against a Mr. Fox... I spent what was probably a few hours looking around for more of an explanation as to what was going on, but just like Amy, all I found was, what time is it, Mr. Fox, thing, carved into every wooden wall that was still somewhat upright. I needed to assume that Amy was correct and that I was being hunted by Mr. Fox. God, that sounds so stupid, doesn't it? I grabbed a journal and the inkwell, along with my flashlight and voice recorder, and left Trevino Manor. You're probably wondering, but Brendan, spirit, sir, wouldn't you be safer in the house? Well, that's a great question. After thinking about all the evidence laid before me, I came to the assumption that Mr. Fox could take me whenever he wanted. He either liked toying with his prey, or, I, I don't know... Maybe he feeds off fear. That's a bit cliché, but I couldn't rule out the possibility. Either way, the longer I hid in the mansion, the more trapped I'd be. If I was going to find a way back to town, it'd be better if I started sooner rather than later. And, I guess, I'd worry about the whole stuck-in-time thing later. Baby steps. I started on the trail through the woods... Right away I noticed the difference in my surroundings. There were no leaves on the trees, for one. The forest felt dead, dry. I admired the confidence of my predecessors uh, had when they built their campfires because it really looked like 
One spark would light up the whole mountain. There weren't any birds or bugs or anything either. No wind blowing through the trees. I don't think I'd ever heard nature be so quiet before. It wasn't peaceful at all. It was unnerving. And it was perfectly clear to me that I was the only thing moving in Trevino Forest tonight. At least so far. I had no clue where I'd entered the trail when I stumbled across it the previous day. And there weren't really any landmarks to go by, so I figured I'd just follow the road all the way to the end. It had to go somewhere, right? But an hour up the trail, I found something that I hadn't seen when I came through the first time. A little dirt-walking trail intersected the road here. It must have been covered by bushes earlier, back when the forest was more than a bunch of dead trees drowning in magnolia moonlight. I knelt down slowly and contemplated. I had three options. Turn left, turn right, or keep going the direction I was heading and ignore the trail entirely. I didn't have a lot of quiet time to think, though. Seconds after I stood up, I felt a tingle on the back of my neck, like I'd gotten too close to an old tube TV and felt the static coming over my skin. I instinctively froze in place, listening for any noise, but the forest was so quiet my ears were whistling to make up for the void of sound. Was I being paranoid, or should I trust my gut? It was the longest few seconds of my life, filled with the purest silence I'd ever encountered. Suddenly, without warning, a guttural shriek pierced through the trees, a lonely wail filled with despair, terror, and rage. It came from, from everywhere at once, and it felt like it was aimed right at, at me. I... Sorry. It only lasted uh, a couple of seconds, but the r raw emotion behind it, I, I can't even... Be... Never mind, that's not important. The point is, it was the worst thing I'd ever heard in my life, and I did not wait around to meet the creature that made it. I don't remember exactly what went through my head, a million things, heat of the moment and all that, but I do remember suddenly thinking of Amy's final word, the message she wrote with what may have been the last of her energy. Left. I still don't know if that's what she meant, but it definitely helped make the decision for me. Before I even understood the thought process that had just gone through my head, I was running down the left path. The road was flat for about ten seconds worth of sprinting before it suddenly sloped downwards. I was airborne for a couple of seconds before I hit the ground, and rolled head first into a tree. I couldn't tell if the creature screamed again or if it was just the sound ringing in my head, but once the immediate pain passed, everything felt quiet again. I stayed on the ground for a few minutes, thinking something along the lines of, if Mr. Fox chooses this moment to make me his Mr. Lunch, then he can knock his Mr. Self out, but with more colorful language. Eventually, I pulled myself to my feet and looked into the direction I'd just come from. It was a pretty steep hill driving down into a wooded valley that swept through the mountains. I'd rolled quite a ways off the path before hitting anything, almost all the way to the floor of the valley. It looked like the road slowly curved to the right just after dipping, following the incline at a much more relaxed angle than the way I went. It looked like I'd be able to meet up with it further down the mountain without having to hike back up to where I'd fallen. Before starting my way through the valley, I bent down to pick up the items that I'd dropped. Obviously, the voice recorder was fine. The bulb in my flashlight had exploded somewhere along the fall, but fortunately, the moonlight was strong enough that I didn't really need my own light. The inkwell had shattered, too, spilling cold blank ink all over my clothes and skin. And the journal. The journal was absolutely drenched in ink. Way more ink than what could have possibly been in that little bottle. The thick, slimy liquid made the book slide out of my hands as I tried to pick it up. Panicking, I desperately flipped through the pages. Some of them were so wet they fell apart in my hands as I turned past them. 
The words were all smudged and illegible, with the exception of one phrase. Nish Hediku was astonishingly clear. Centered perfectly in the last clean spot on the edge of the paper, sticking out against the otherwise black page like the full moon in the sky above me. I slammed the book shut and kicked it in a fit of rage. It collided with the tree a few feet away and, with a soggy squelch sound, dropped to the dirt below. I tried to wipe the ink off my hands, but it had already dried. I let out an angry sigh and started marching toward the point where the road met the valley up ahead. I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't cautious. I was pissed. I was on a mission. Not only was I being hunted, I just destroyed the only record I had of anything going on here. I'd lost what may have been the last accounts of all the people who'd been lost in Trevino Forest before me. I didn't care what it took. I was going to reach the end of the road, wherever it led. I had to, for Amy and for the rest. Thinking back, I may have hit my head a little harder than I realized. One spilled vial of ink and I suddenly felt I owed someone something? I should have just given up. I should have gone back to the main road and followed it to the end. But I didn't. I don't remember much between kicking the journal and meeting the end of the road. Maybe I went on autopilot. I don't know. Uh, or maybe I was just getting used to the whole time isn't real thing. But I honestly couldn't tell you if I was walking for minutes, hours, or even days. I only know I snapped to attention when I took my first step off the gravel and onto the coarse yellow grass. I stopped in my tracks and looked behind me. The road just ended. After all that, it just stopped. It didn't really seem to lead anywhere either, just a grassy mound surrounded by the otherwise thick forest. But now that I was here, I was exhausted. Every sore muscle I had ignored on the way there hit me tenfold. It happened so suddenly that I nearly collapsed. I wasn't about to turn around and go back. It wouldn't hurt to take a break, right? I sat on a tiny little hill in the middle of the clearing and closed my eyes. As I relaxed, my bones felt like they were melting inside my muscles. Within seconds, I was already falling asleep, until a soft rustling sound in the grass next to me snapped me awake. I tried to sit up straight and ended up toppling off the mound face first. Scrambled to my feet with my back against the tree and scanned the clearing hastily. No movement. Had I just imagined it? Maybe I fell asleep and dreamt it. Behind me, deep in the forest, I heard another unearthly shriek slice through the trees. I screamed too and jumped toward the mound again, losing my footing halfway through and tumbling onto the grass. I turned mid-fall to face the dark woods behind me, and just before I hit the ground, I saw, or thought I saw, a shimmer of white light shaped like a person. I hit the ground for like the hundredth time tonight, and tried to sit up again to take another look, but I couldn't move. My eyes were wide open, staring up at the full moon through the clearing above me. I couldn't feel my arms or legs or even the ground I was lying on. I also couldn't breathe. I felt like someone was pressing down on my chest. Just as that thought crossed my mind, something moved at the bottom of my vision. A tuft of dark, dirty red hair appeared inches in front of me. It was definitely human hair. It was done up in a chignon with messy little curls spiraling down above my head. As the figure rose closer to my eyes, I finally saw a horrible face. The skin was leathery, gray, and wrinkled, like a poorly preserved corpse. The eyes were milky white, but they were set so far back in their deep pits of sockets, I could barely see them at all. The lips were withered away, revealing a mouth half full of rotting yellow teeth. She crawled up my body until her face was level with mine. 
She cocked her head curiously and let out a soft, rattling breath. I tried to scream, but I could still not breathe or move at all. Fortunately, something else screamed instead. That same horrible, guttural howl again. It wasn't coming from the shriveled hag pressing me into the grassy knoll. It was coming from behind her, in the same direction I'd heard it before, but much closer. She didn't react, but the sound gave my body the jump start it needed. I rolled over onto my stomach, knocking the woman off me in the process, and kicked myself over the mound, running back up the trail. I made it back up the mountain to the intersection in a matter of seconds. I didn't really have time to worry about the fact that it was impossible for that road to be so short now, when I know it was much, much longer before. I was more worried about the time travel and zombie chicks and whatever a Mr. Fox is. When I got back to the main road, I turned left, heading the direction I would have gone if I'd never found the trail in the first place. I could hear heavy panting behind me, and I heard dirt and rocks fly as feet pounded the ground. I could barely see through my watering eyes, but I wasn't going to stop no matter what it took. I was going to get out of Trevino Forest, even if I had to sprint for days without rest. So, I made it about five minutes before I collapsed to the ground. Why was I running so hard? It's just making your legs go. There's nothing athletic about that. As I chilled there in the dirt, nervously fidgeting with my voice recorder, I noticed two things. First, I wasn't being chased anymore. If I was... I'd be dead by now. I couldn't hear the footsteps or the breathing anymore, though I hadn't noticed them stop either. The second thing I noticed was that this road was taking me very near the bottom of a steep, rocky cliff on the side of a nearby mountain. That intrigued me. If I could find a way up the cliff that didn't require a very quick crash course in rock climbing, I'd be able to get a good view of the rest of the forest and maybe see which way the exit was. After allowing myself time to catch my breath, I continued the rest of the way up the road at a nice leisurely pace. The road narrowed significantly by the time I reached the cliff. It was now no bigger than the walking trail that I'd followed to get to the mound earlier. Much more interesting, however, was the fact that the path led directly to the side of the cliff, where a small cave entrance lay almost concealed among the rest of the rocky wall. Curiosity killed the cat, right? There was no way I was stepping foot inside that cave. I was going to stick with my original plan and find a way to go up to the top of the mountain and completely forget about the cave. I was not going to enter the cave at all. As I entered the cave a couple seconds later, I noticed the temperature drop by at least 10 degrees. It widened up significantly after the first few feet of tightness. To my surprise, I could actually see through the darkness. There was no source of light, and the top of the cave didn't open up to the moonlight sky at all. But for some reason, the inside of this cave was just as well lit as the rest of the forest. Maybe I'd acquired night vision. It wouldn't be the strangest thing to happen to me tonight. So the cave was more of a cavern, aside from the tunnel entrance. It was basically just a large, roundish, underground cavity. More interesting, though, is that something, by my guess, Mr. Fox, seemed to have been using this cavern as a den. There were bones scattered around the edges of the room, claw marks on the walls, and even some branches piled up in a back crevice that resembled a sort of nest. There was something else, though. A slab of rock that had been chiseled almost completely flat, just near the wall on the right. And maybe a shelf? And a den? That seemed... I was going to say unlikely, but as I said before, tonight was packed with the exceptionally unlikely. Something that did take me by surprise, though, was what was sitting on the shelf. It looked like a book stack of small boxes and even an old oil lamp. Why would a beast need a book and a lamp? While I admit that the image that pops into my head every time I hear Mr. Fox 
is an anthropomorphic fox man with a monocle and a top hat that seemed a little too silly to be true. More realistically, and I use the word realistically very loosely here, it was some sort of werewolf thing. What the hell am I saying? My heart felt like it was beating against the back of my throat. I didn't want to hang out in a monster's lair while it was still hunting me, especially with only one entrance and exit. But something about the book caught my eye. Just a quick peek, right? I approached the little rock desk quickly and quietly, dancing across the cavern on the balls of my feet. It didn't take long to see why the book drew my attention. It was plain black with no title or words written anywhere on the cover, and a dark red border dashed across the front. It was the same book that I found empty on the desk in the library, and the one that was filled with chilling encounters when I found it in the dining room at midnight. Before I got to open it, though, I suddenly got a look at the boxes I'd seen from afar. There were actually picture frames, three of them, unlike any I'd ever seen, but still picture frames. The edges were padded with a sort of leather embossed with a floral pattern. The middle was a sheet of opaque glass, but the images of people were sort of burned on. Two of them featured a couple. It was hard to make out any features, but they seemed to be about my age, maybe a little older. The third one showed the woman from the other two pictures, alone this time. She was wearing a light-colored dress, probably white or yellow, had a necklace of pearls, and had her hair done up in a chignon, just like the rotting lady I'd met in the forest. As I flipped to the mirrored vision on the back, her face almost seemed to move, like it was coming to life right in front of me. Unlike everything else I'd seen tonight, this was definitely just an optical illusion. A very good one, but not real. I was so transfixed that I almost didn't notice the words carved into the tooled leather along the bottom of the frame. Madame de Chien, 1886. I checked the rest of the frame, but all that I saw was a little symbol marked at the bottom right corner, featuring four crescent moon shapes with the letters... K.F. in the middle. The other two frames both said Martin A. Madame de Chien, with the same little moon mark stamped into the corners. Martin de Chien. That was the name of the man Amy was supposed to be looking for, wasn't it? Maybe it was a relative named after an ancestor. The coincidence was too much for it to be just a coincidence. Curiously, I set the photographs back down and opened up the book. It was being used as a journal, just like before, but this time the words were different. The handwriting was beautiful and elegant, and filled up almost the entire book. I looked up at the entrance to the cave and, satisfied that there was nothing lurking there at this precise moment, I sat down on the cave floor and I began reading. The journal was written by a Josephine Duchenne, the same person who had supposedly called Amy's newspaper. So there goes the coincidence theory. Her husband had fallen ill with something called the consumption, and she was desperate to keep him out of a sanatorium for the sake of their newborn daughter. They'd searched all over Europe looking for the power to save him, but had no luck until now. But whenever that is... She'd said she'd found a book in an abandoned cellar in her hometown of Lazare, detailing mysterious rituals and dangerous spirits that were meant to be forgotten by man. Her words, not mine. One phrase caught my eye. Nish Hediku. It was the ritual said to grant eternal life to all who performed it, but with a catch. It had to be performed on the ground most sacred to the spirit being summoned near a small tribe of Pawnee people in the United States. The Duchenne family was so committed to their book of legends that they moved to the New World. They built a mansion in the sacred forest and had the entire tribe of forest guardians executed. So, you know, nice folks. At this point, the journal suddenly started featuring dates above the entries. On Thursday, the 3rd of October, 1889... 
Josephine had found the sacred location where the spirit's mortal body was said to be buried. The following Wednesday, October 9th, she carried Martin to the location and waited until nightfall. Under the full moon, she offered... No, th that couldn't be right. She said she offered her daughter to the gods. She even described exactly where she cut to make her daughter bleed the most. I nearly puked in the book. I was absolutely disgusted by her actions. She wanted to keep Martin out of a sanatorium for the sake of their daughter, and then they end up sacrificing the child for a chance at eternal life? I wanted to stop reading, but I was so close to the end. There were only four short entries left. First, in November 1889, Madame Duchesne lamented that the ritual hadn't worked. However, instead of accepting that the legend was just a legend, she used her journal to brainstorm ideas for better sacrifices. Then, after a long gap, she skipped to the 2nd of July, 1890, she had taken her sickly husband down to the sacred mound again, and she sacrificed him. She sacrificed the husband she had done all this to save. She sacrificed him with the same knife she had used on their daughter. She sacrificed him without even a hint of guilt or shame. The next entry was short and chilling. Word for word it read, 31 July, 1890. The darkness reaches out to me. I count the seconds. I can feel eternity. The last entry I ripped from the book. I had to read it word for word. It didn't have a date, but it was about six pages after the previous one and was written in rushed words. What time is it, Mr. Fox? The darkness thickens, morning knocks, but the vicious night won't let you in. Twelve o'clock, the darkness wins. What time is it? Still the same. The pounding silence, the fox's game. They'll never see another day. At twelve o'clock, he marks his prey. What time is it? Filled with fear, the fox's shriek is all they hear. As night surrounds them, the day's still ignored. At twelve o'clock, he takes one more. What time is it? Once again, the darkness creeps out from its den. It shouts through shadows like a drill, and at twelve o'clock, time stands still. What time is it? There is no light. He came and brought with him the night. What time is it? It's wide awake. At twelve o'clock, you're his to take. At twelve o'clock, time fades away. It's midnight, all night. Every day. Count the seconds. Watch the clocks. What time is it, Mr. Fox? The words chilled me. They drained me. I was tired, so tired. It's been a long night, literally. I'm done running. I got out my voice recorder while still sitting on the floor of the cavern and started recording. I wish I had answers. I only have questions. And I'm afraid, my f friends, that's all you'll have, too. I'm sure there's something hunting me, some kind of beast stalking me from the shadows. But I couldn't tell you what it is. Maybe a wolf. Maybe it was a Mr. Fox, eh? Couldn't tell you either why someone put that journal on the desk in the library for me to find. What left meant. Who called Amy Shikar pretending to be Joseph Duchenne? What they, they, what they did with her once she got here. One thing I feel very strongly about, though, is that the decaying lady is Madame Duchesne herself. She's even wearing the same dress she had on in the pictures. It's, it's pink, not yellow or white. She walks like, like a newborn foal, wobbly legs and j jagged, jagged movements. She sounds raspy, like she's, well, like she's trying to talk, but she c can't form words. I know that something, something dark, is standing in the cave entrance b behind her. Uh, and it's blocking the light. 
It's getting dark in here. It, it was waiting for me to... It wanted me to record my voice, to tell my story. But why? I don't have anywhere to, to go, friends. I expect I'll have answers soon. But you never will. For now, I, I think it's safe to say... I think it's safe to say that Madame Josephine Duchesne got what she wanted. Immortality. She's getting close, I can hear her, but I can't see her. All I can see is a pair of glowing eyes in the cave entrance behind her in the shadow, watching. Watching. <laughs> this is B Brendan Spirit signing up. I'm on the lookout for a new job, but I think it's time that I got a job that has nothing at all to do with IT. I mean nothing. No computers, no keyboards, mice, motherboards, wired networks, wireless networks. Definitely no PEBCAC. Look it up. You'll laugh. And most importantly and most absolutely, definitely no backup tapes degauss them, burn them in a fire, and piss on the smoldering ashes. Your monthly foals and nightly incrementals can go to hell. Oh, what's that? You want your most precious files safe, up to the minute? Tough. Don't look at me, not anymore. Would it surprise you if I told you I lost my job last week? Right, I know. Probably not. But it's not what you think. I quit. I had no choice in the matter, really. Sorry if saving my own ass from a psychopathic boss ranks higher in importance uh, to me than my paycheck. A paycheck that helped keep the beer fridge and the herb jar full, and my penchant for pizza and gaming satiated. I'd be fine if that was all I had to worry about funding these days. But since my folks booted me out of the hole in their basement, after what happened, I have to add rent to that list. Utilities and a car payment. Damn. Gas. Otherwise, I'd be fine not working at all. No job is worth dying for. One reason I'm having such a tough time funding work is because not only did I quit a paying job with an okay career outlook, I left the next gig, the one I quit for the first one for, after only one day. I know, I know. I sound like a spoiled brat, and I wouldn't know a hard day's work if it hit me square in the jaw. Oh, boo-hoo. You had to live inside the basement of your mommy and daddy's mansion. How dreadful. But you know what? Screw you if that's what you say. You have no idea what kind of life I've led from a few words out of my mouth. So keep your preconserved judgment out of this and hear me out. There really are very good reasons for both of those employment. Well, unemployment decisions. You may not believe me, and hey, that's your prerogative and all that, but at least I'm laying it all out in the line so that some considerate soul might see that I'm not BSing here. If it gets me a decent job, again, not in IT, please God, not IT. Talking about all of this again might be worthwhile. I may, you know, die a horrible death and all that from telling the world about this, but I got little choice. Back about a year ago, I graduated with a BA in computer science out of BU. About a month before graduation, I landed an intern-like job with a law office out of Cambridge. I say intern-like because unlike an internship, I got nothing in the way of college credit for it and the pay was about what you'd expect. The office had recently lost their sole desktop support admin, and they needed to quickly fill the role until they could find someone permanent. I didn't ask what happened to the last guy, and I didn't at all much care. I was just thankful he was gone and left the opening there for me. The typical work day was pretty much your run-of-the-mill desktop support monkey stuff. 
making sure printers were kept full and unjammed, dealing with malware and overabundance of spam, Wi-Fi issues, and that sort of thing. I also had to make sure the tapes from the backup server were rotated out every night. This meant removing the previous night's incremental backup tapes, storing them in an off-site delivery storage container, and placing fresh tapes back into the jukes box for the next nightly incremental run. Except on Fridays. That was the scheduled full backup run. My boss, Don Huber, Esquire, insisted on not reusing older tapes on account of stricter guidelines for data retention in the law office, or some such. The office was on the small side, about 25 people, all of them with desktops. I kept them all working and clean, inside and out, and all of them got backed up, including the on-premise email server. Toward the end of the last month of my employment there, Huber, who I should mention is one of the three partners of the firm, called me into his office. Let me tell you about this Huber. I feared that guy. I'm not a small man myself, and I don't tend to intimidate easily. But this guy gave me the creeps. He towered at least six, seven, thin as a rail. His sixty-something-year-old face was gaunt and pale, except for the swollen nose that the man couldn't stop blowing into that godforsaken, crusty handkerchief he kept in his pocket. And his breath, dear Lord, his breath. I swear to God, a cloud of that crap lingered around an hour after he left the office. And despite his constant coffee binging, he always looked tired and uninterested in anyone, never smiling past those bloody gums of his. God forbid he ever look at you with his two piss holes in the snow. Jonathan, he said. My name's Jonathan, but I was not about to correct him. Close the door. <laughs> that breath. Huber continued in his drawn-out, tired way. And Jonathan, that's all he said. Was the guy trying to make me correct him? I didn't take the bait. Yes. Backups. We make sure all of our computers and email are backed up every evening. Am I right? I nodded. And the old backups are stored out of the office by that uh, something mountain place. Yeah, I said. They're taken every night about five o'clock. And how many years of backups would you say they have? Wow. All of them? Say about seven years worth? He considered this a long moment. I have an important assignment for you that's going to take some time, a bit of overtime work. Wonderful. Okay, I said, hoping to sound more disappointed than pissed off. Will that be a problem, he asked. All right, so I sounded pissed off. Nope, I said. Let me know what you need. Huber glared at me. There was no fooling this guy. I mean, he's a lawyer, for crying out loud. I am not. But I don't think he gave a crap about my feelings, except for making sure that I was sufficiently terrified of him and uncomfortable. I'm working on a case. It's one that's uh, very personal to me. So I need to trust that you'll keep the details of what you're doing to yourself. Don't speak of it to anyone else, inside or outside of this office. Do you understand, Jonathan? I nodded. The details of Huber's task were pretty simple, but the deed itself was not. Our 90s era email server stored file attachments on a local file server, separately from the messages. Huber laid out a rule long ago that the attachment storage had to be cleaned out of everything on the first of every month. Every month. You had to have any documents you wanted retained, printed, and filed, then allow the system to purge automatically, probably as some sort of legal thing. Don't ask me. Remember, I'm not a lawyer. Now he needed me to go through the past year to retrieve all of his files for this case of his. That meant retrieving a bunch of tapes, then spending hours, make that days, restoring both the full and incremental backups of every system. A major pain in the ass. And Jonathan, do not, under any circumstances, view the files you're retrieving. It is of important legal procedure, that you do not view them. Is that understood? Yep. Uh, I mean, yes. 
Understood. With that, I'd say he was as satisfied as he was going to be. The following Monday, two crates of 8mm mag tapes filled the desk in my butthole of a backroom office, and I got to work. Probably most of you have not worked with these old backup tape jukeboxes. Well, let me tell you, they suck. They're a pain in the ass to load, and the robotic arm for rotating tapes in and out of the drive is dog-ass slow. I also had to perform the file restores early in the morning, after the nightly backups ran, since I only had the one unit to work with. This is three, four in the morning we're talking about, mind you. It was either start then or never get anything done for the people in the office all day. You can be sure as hell I was logging all that overtime and strolling into the office later than usual. At first, the file restores were pretty run-of-the-mill crap. Thousands of Word documents and PDFs, images, probably photos of crime scenes. There were some audio tapes here and there, too, most likely from testimony recordings and the like. And just like Huber, the Uber creep, asked, I didn't open any of them. That is, until the video files started to dump out. It's like this. Boring does not even begin to describe those nights. Brain numbing. That works. If I was in law school, maybe I could dig into the tomes in the office library, read up on some old cases, something like that. Even then, I was barely able to keep my eyes open, so my head wasn't so much ready for soaking in knowledge at that hour. The firewall, one that I, sadly, still did not control, blocked access to anything you'd consider fun to watch or read. Managed by some third party or something. And now there's these videos I'm seeing restore back onto the file server. Mind you, videos aren't something you see very often within email attachments at that place. I'm not sure they knew how to operate the cameras on their phones, let alone transfer files from one. They weren't the most technical bunch. It was coming on two in the morning. I was bored. And I now had something that could pose as entertainment. So I double-clicked the first one, and I watched. What popped up into the video player window was messed up, to put it mildly. A heavy-set woman in about her late fifties. She was bound and gagged, tied to a chair, in what looked like some kind of dirty basement. She was dressed in a soiled white nightgown, her graying hair laying wet and matted against her face and forehead. At first, I thought this was just some disturbing crime scene evidence, that the woman was dead and the camera operator took video rather than stills. Only no one else was in the room, no cops, and the woman was not dead. She appeared to be asleep or passed out, as you could clearly see she was breathing. The person working the camera rotated around the seated woman, making no sound other than the occasional footfall upon the concrete. The video turned to focus on the woman's right thigh, where a smear of blood ran down it from a small wound. The camera came to a stop and clicked into place, presumably into a tripod. A hand came into view then, wearing surgical gloves holding a syringe. It jabbed into the woman and plunged whatever liquid it held, then pulled away. Some shuffling off camera and hands were back again with another needle. Only this one, this one was huge. He inserted this long-ass needle into the woman's leg, right about at the bleeding wound. The hand moved away, and I could see it was a blood-drawing needle, filling something I couldn't see. About a minute later, the needle was withdrawn. More blood trickles down the woman's leg. A bag of blood swung into view with number 000 sloppily written on it in Sharpie. A click, and the camera was raised up again, focusing on the woman's face. There was a soft kissing noise, and the gloved hand came into view again, pressing two fingers against the woman's lips. The video ended. I closed the video player window and couldn't have gotten out of that place faster than if it had been on fire. The next morning I called in sick. It wasn't exactly a lie. I really didn't feel well. I had a sleepless night to what I'd just watched, and I felt like complete garbage. 
I was told Huber wasn't happy about me being out, personally asking about my work on his special project. Rather than risk getting outright fired, I told them to let him know I'd make it in that night to make progress. I wasn't sure what to do at that point. I had no idea of the content of that video, and I didn't know who it belonged to as they stored on the attachment server. Uh, they aren't labeled with what email message they belong to. Without the accompanying email itself, the attachment is just there. I'd have to restore the old emails as well if I wanted to match them up. If I let Huber know I was touching those files, he'd can my ass in a heartbeat. For my own sake of sanity, I just assumed it was a disturbing evidence for a case long since closed and went back to work that night. Around 1 a.m., more files were restored from the tapes. I was more than halfway done at that point. I took a look at the progress in the expanding list of files. More videos. I wasn't sure I wanted to chance another one, but of course I did. I was like a dead cat like that. The video I opened this time was yet another bloodletting. The same woman, same place, only this time, the woman was much thinner, and her leg was not looking good at all. The wound looked infected and festering, and there was a lot more dried blood. This time, she's not so passed out, but close enough to it. She mumbled something behind the cloth blocking her mouth, while the unseen cameraman went to work. This time, the baggy field was labeled number 011. I wasn't watching them in order. Dear God, there were ten more of these. Maybe more. I opened another video, this time the window filled with something much different and definitely much more disturbing. The camera faced Don Huber's unoccupied desk. The old man came into view holding a steaming mug of coffee and a brown paper bag. He sat at his desk and calmly opened the paper bag, removing one of those bags of blood. He held it up to the camera. It was half full with the label number 008 written on it, and the old man smiled. He freaking smiled. That's not the most disturbing part. Huber took this bag of blood and squeezed about a half cup of it into his coffee mug. He sealed the bag back up again, put it into the paper bag. He stuck his index finger into the cup, squirreled it around, mixing it all up. Then, in a big gulp, it went down the hatch. He swallowed down what must have been half the mug. Then he lowered his arm. His lips and teeth were stained red. He looked at the camera and he smiled. And then he laughed. It's not just a chuckle. It's a full-blown cackle of insanity. Tears streamed down the man's face, the laughter becoming more maniacal. He took another swig. Another until the mug was drained dry. Again he smiled and again he laughed. He wiped tears from his face and walked from behind the desk, off camera. The video ended. I'm not sure how long I sat there at my desk in silence. I couldn't get the sound of Huber's insane laugh out of my head. I couldn't erase that bizarre image of him sucking down that concoction and finishing it off with a bloody grin, enjoying every last drop. And there were more of them. With the files that continued to restore onto the server, were more videos, lots more. I'd like to say that I refrained from watching them. I mean, that's what a sane, rational person would do, right? That person would have seen quite enough. He'd stop right there, maybe go to the police with that. He might get fired for being wrong, and then for opening files he was told outright not to open. But if he was right, some imprisoned woman is maybe saved and that vampire gets locked up. I'd be a hero, one who broke the trust of his employer for justice. Yeah, that worked out well for everyone else who's blown a whistle. Didn't help I was barely out of college. The remaining videos were more of the same. Bags labeled anywhere between 000 and number 021 were filled, then later consumed. Always with the laughter and smiles, now it made sense why Huber's breath 
was so goddamn bad. As I watched the old man cackle in another video, I felt I could smell the rancid odor through the screen. No, I could actually smell it. Jonathan, how was the project coming along? It was Huber. There, in the office. It was three in the morning, and I was alone with that blood-guzzling freak. I nearly crapped myself. Oh, Miss, Mr. Huber, hi. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The restorers are still, um, chug along. Should be done in another day or so. The old man pursed his lips and nodded slightly, not taking his bloodshot eyes off me. He was carrying a coffee mug. The coffee mug. Dear Christ. Just got off the phone with my mom, I lied. Told her where I was and that everything's good and I'll be home soon. I thought telling Huber I'd be missed would keep me from becoming another one of his blood supplies. His lack of reaction told me he didn't seem to care. Uh, so, what brought you round here so late? I asked. Or is it early? Late. High-profile corporate litigation I'm working on. Couldn't sleep if I tried. This will be my home for a while. So, Mrs. Huber, your wife, she doesn't get upset at you being away? Huber narrowed his eyes. I must have touched a nerve. Now I wished I'd called my mom. Thankfully, it didn't take long for his luck to soften. Lydia, Mrs. Huber, is... She's not well. Bedridden. Has been for months. I have someone taking care of her while I'm occupied with this case. I nodded and mouthed the silent ah of understanding. Anyway, I'm glad you're still here, John. I'm going to head out now, but I need you to print out a list of the files you've been able to restore so far and leave it on my desk. I'll leave the door open. Uh, sure, no problem. Thank the good Lord. I wouldn't be alone with him anymore. I hope the elation in my voice wasn't too apparent. Huber left, taking most of his dragon breath along with him. Before leaving myself, I got the file listing printouts and brought them into his office. It's not often I go into that room. It's kept locked when Huber's not around, and somehow he kept his PC out of technical trouble, which meant little need for me to enter. And that's why I never bothered to notice the photos sitting on his desk before. It was the woman in the videos. The bloodied, tied-up woman in the chair. Huber's wife. The papers fell from my hand. I grabbed them up as quickly as they'd fallen, threw them on the old man's desk, and got the hell out of Dodge. I went over the whole thing in my head as I sped home. Huber, that sick son of a bitch, had his wife tied up in his basement, draining the poor woman into blood bags and chugging her down like some sort of macabre breakfast drink. And then the smiling, the laughing, the tears of laughter, drinking every goddamn drop. What the hell was he? And why in God's name was he taking videos of the whole process? He had to be emailing them off to someone. But to whom? And why? The sun was rising by the time I walked into the door at home. Needless to say, I wasn't much ready for sleeping. Rather than dwell further on what I'd just learned about Huber, I got to work on the most logical thing I could think of. My resume. I was getting out of that office as soon as possible. Either Huber would be caught and taken to jail, causing the whole firm to crumble, and all of its jobs along with it, or that vampire would find me fit to fill more blood bags. And no thanks. Having sent my resume off to as many IT support job postings as I, as I could find and fit into, I finally passed out on my keyboard at about 10 in the morning. By the time I woke up early that afternoon, I had a voicemail from a recruiter from one of the jobs I applied for. I called them back, set up an interview for the following day, and headed back to work. I had a little skip in my step, knowing it may not be so long before I wouldn't be going back there anymore. Inside my office, the printouts from the previous night sat on my desk. A post-it note stuck on the top of the pile had Huber's handwriting on it. Continue project. Move all files ending in 
dot m4v onto USB storage. Do not open the files. The video files. Of course, that's what he wanted. The crazy asshole wanted to keep them all for posterity or something. Then probably take the tapes and have them destroyed. Sure, I wanted to get the hell out of that job. But I did not want to let Huber get away with what he was up to. I decided that not only would I copy those videos to a USB key for Huber, I'd make a copy for myself, along with the emails they attached to. I just needed to complete the file recovery that night, then restore and save the emails from the same time period with my own copy. With that, I could send it all off to the cops anonymously and hope they nail that creep and save his wife before she's nothing but dry flesh and bones. I managed to avoid Huber the entire day. I swear to God, I thought I heard his cackling laughter from behind his closed door on a few occasions. That bony finger swirling around in his mug, that blood-stained grin. As the next dawn crept up on me, I'd completed restoring the last of the incremental backups. I had fifty or sixty videos stored under two USB storage keys. One copy for Huber, one for me. As planned, I restored all of the old emails for myself as well. I left Huber's copy on the desk in his office, which was thankfully unoccupied, and left for home to get some sleep. I had an interview to rest for, for a job I hope I could start ASAP. The interview was for ten that morning. After about five hours of shut-eye, I downed a pot of coffee, primped myself up, and arrived with a little time to spare. The job was for an IT consulting business that had set up shop within just the past six months. Business was taking off and they needed to fill some entry-level remote tech positions to keep up with the onslaught of demand. I nailed it. They made me an offer on the spot, and I snatched it right up. I'd only met with a couple of the lead techs, but I sufficiently impressed them enough to fill one of the spots. I strolled into my old office that afternoon to find the storage containers. All of the backup tapes gone. I knew it. Huber got in early, got rid of them all. He was covering his sick and demented ass from being found out. Likely he was toasting another mug of his vile brew to whatever fire melted the tapes down to a nondescript heap of plastic. That night, while Huber was re-watching and reliving his gory, glory days of sucking down the blood of his wife, I'd be working to match up my own copy of them to the emails he sent and shut them down. I used my time at the office to type up my letter of resignation. I threw it onto Huber's unoccupied desk and checked right the hell out of there. On my way home, I got a call from the new job. It wasn't one I was expecting. Hi, Jonah. Hey, this is Steve Page from Pewter Pros. You seem like a cool dude. Thought we might meet up tonight for a couple of cold ones with some of the team. Welcome you aboard. What do you say? That sounds fantastic, is what I said. And that I'd head out that way after the office closed, about seven o'clock. Meanwhile, I had some videos and emails to deal with. When I got home, I flopped onto the couch with my laptop and threw on some TV. I plugged the USB key with the videos and emails into the laptop, copied everything off, and got to work. Opening the email files was pretty straightforward. All that was left was to match the file names and dates to Huber's outgoing emails, and I'd have the bastard by the balls. After about an hour of searching, I found what I was looking for. Make that half of what I was searching for. I was able to match Huber's outgoing emails to only half the videos, those of him doing the blood drinking and the laughing. There were no email subjects. Nothing in the body of the message, just the video and one recipient, pppkg at gmail.com. It was when I searched Huber's inbox that I found the messages attached to the other half of the videos. Huber wasn't sending the videos of his wife. He was receiving them from someone else. Unlike Huber's outgoing messages, these emails did contain a message. They were all sent from the same address he'd been sending to. 
I read only the first. Subject, do you love her? Hello, Donnie. Or should I call you soulless, blood-sucking Lawyer Don, Esquire. I like that name better. You should change it. I'll keep this short because I know you're a busy man and have a lot more blood-sucking to do. And now, I don't mean that metaphorically, as you'll see from the attached video. You may remember that when you took me into your employment, part of that deal was the promise of your firm finding help for my wife. You and I had a gentleman's agreement. In return for free assistance from me for your office, you'd assist us in suing the company responsible for the accident resulting in my wife's handicap. That's not what happened. Instead, after several years of my free services to your firm, you turned against me and my family. You saw that there was more to be gained by representing the other party, turned around and countersued us on their behalf. They won. You won. I lost nearly everything. Last night I lost my wife. It's time now for you to lose something. It's up to you for how long. For your Lydia to remain alive, your instructions are simple. Firstly, do not forward this message or its contents to the authorities, nor make them aware of it in any way. I still control your firewall and know what comes in and out of there at all times. I will know. You could, of course, copy the files and send them some other way, but I know this. Your wife is kept alive only by my administering her with the basic nutrients to stay that way. So if I were to, say, be killed or go to jail, she's as good as gone. Don't worry, Donnie. You won't be without your wife entirely. I will be sending you that bag of her blood one every few days or so. In return... You'll be required to drink it. All of it, like the bloodsucker you are. And how will I know? You will record a video of yourself doing this and email it as an attachment back to me. But, and here's the most important part, you must show me how much you enjoy it. Show me how much you're enjoying every last drop of it, you blood-sucking backstabber. I don't care how many cupfuls it takes or what the hell you mix it with, but you will drink that bag dry and you will smile and you will laugh and you will convince me you love it. Your first delivery comes tomorrow morning. I expect your first video within four hours of that. Tell no authorities. Tell no one. Oh, and I quit. Enjoy your breakfast. The Kenster. The Canster. I knew I heard that stupid nickname somewhere before. Was it at the office? Yeah, that was it. First day of work. One of the delivery guys who sometimes picked up the backup tapes once asked where the Kenster was. I had no idea who he was talking about. Now I knew. He was the IT guy I replaced. Before he left, he cleaned up anything and everything in the systems about him. Everything gone. Almost everything gone, I should say. I still had the restored email. I checked the time. Seven o'clock. Late. Damn it. Drowning my shot nerves in alcohol sounded like a decent plan at the time. I called a cab and met up with Steve Page and the other pewter pros at the bar across town about a half hour later. After a couple hours of us chatting about all things geek, I was happily on my way to becoming plastered and forgetting about the whole nightmare with Huber. That ended right quick. Steve said, Don't worry if you get stuck with a tough client on the job, Jonah. We've all had our run-ins with him. Psh, remember that old bat who insisted on me reinstalling Windows 95? Another pro named Andy said, Ninety freaking nine. I had to torrent and burn some old ISO of the thing. I hoped it wasn't teeming with hidden North Korean malware party. Steve gave him a punch in the shoulder. Jesus, Andy. Seriously? You don't know that? Anyway, Jonah, if you get stuck with a nut like that, you can come talk to me or find the boss. Because if you can't do it, they all said in unison, 
The Kenster can. I choked on my last sip of beer like I was drowning. Sorry, the, the Kenster? I managed to blurt out between coughs. Damn, you okay? Well, yeah, man. He owns the shop. Ken Graham. Goes by the Kenster in the nerdy circles, like with us. He's the real pro at pros. Knows how to deal with all types. You go to him with the difficult-to-please ones, and he's got you covered. He's a little quirky, I guess you could say, but you'll love working for him. You know, I wonder what's holding him up. Holding him up, I asked. Yeah, he was supposed to show up tonight. Guess he wants to meet you in particular. I showed him your resume, and I'll be damned if his eyes didn't light right up. Looks like your past experience at that law office paid off. You've already got his eye, big guy. Steve tried to give me another shot in the shoulder, but I was already beelining for the door. There was some confused yelling from behind me as they followed me outside, most likely something to do with my skimping on the tab. I threw myself into the nearest cab and shot home. That was a week ago, so I guess saying I quit my job wasn't so accurate after all. In truth, I hadn't even started it yet. I bet there aren't many people who've done that, not without a backup plan on deck at the time. I have no clue what Huber has planned for those videos he had me restore. Not really sure why he'd have them destroyed, either. If he turns them in, his wife's likely a goner. Maybe she's dead already. Maybe he doesn't care and just wants to stop the blood drinking making sure he's got what he needs to make sure the Kenster pays for what he's done. But the news has been quiet. No reports of a missing or dead Lydia Huber. No arrest of Pewter Pro's owner, Ken Graham. Me? I'm keeping hold of my copy of those files and emails. That insurance at least helps me get a few winks of sleep every night. My parents, of course, haven't understood my unemployment, so I'm out on my ass, basically paying for this dump out of what little savings I have left. That's not much, not anymore. I've tried calling my mom for the past couple of days, basically to beg for her to let me back into their basement, which, believe me, is a vast upgrade from this place. But she's not picking up my calls. It never took very much to disappoint her. Hmm. Getting a text message... God, I hope it's her. You know, I'm still surprised, sometimes, she even knows how to send one. Especially one with a video. Why is she sending... Oh. Oh, dear God. Do you love her?
Tales for Dark Nights.